We are delighted to have with us uh, Randy Osborne, who um, is with Walk the through the Bible ministry, his wife, Marilyn, is with the children. So if you have children with you, elementary age kids, uh, Stacy's right here, just wave your hand. Uh, if you wanna send those, not, these are not preschoolers, okay? Our preschool area, they will take care of your children, right? But the, your preschoolers. But if you have children, Stacy can take those children to our zone area, and they're gonna have a very interactive walk through the Bible Old Testament uh, uh, version as well, okay, teaching time. So that's gonna happen. But we are delighted. We've been talking about this for quite some time. Many of you know that already. So uh, without a, a lot more fanfare, a lot more introduction, uh, I just am so grateful that you are here this morning and that your Bible study, your connect groups, uh, have committed to being here this morning. And so why don't you join me uh, this morning as we welcome Randy and through Walk Through the Bible ministry. Amen? Amen. Can I pray for you? Huh? Can I pray for you? Sure. All right, let's pray together. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for him. Father, we thank you for Randy. We thank you for, uh, for his ministry of teaching and for his wife, Marilyn, as she's going to be teaching our children. And so vital that is to the life uh, the lifeline of this church. And so we thank you. We love you. Bless Randy, Lord, with our ears open, our hearts open this morning. Teach us, we pray by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here with you. I am so excited to walk through the Old Testament. In fact, we are fitting this into your morning schedule, so we're going we're gonna to pick it up a little bit. We're going to sprint a few times, and so you'll feel like that. But we're going to walk through the Old Testament. What we're going to do is we're going to cover the 40 major people, places, and events in chronological order, talking about their geographical location in such a way that when we get finished this morning, you're going to be able to recall everything I've taught you from memory in less than a minute and a half. Oh boy, now here's the caveat. One of the things that we cannot do, oh, I've got a song instead of a slide. There we go. One of the things that we cannot do is we cannot cover every verse. And I'm, go I'm going to put a few verses up, but we're not going to stay anywhere too long because we're just putting it together. How many of y'all have ever put together a jigsaw puzzle? Yeah, how many enjoy putting together a 10,000-piece jigsaw puzzle without the front of the box? You see, that's our goal today, is to give you the front of the box to the Old Testament. And so what we're going to do is we're going to be putting that together and giving you the front of the box. Now, take, um, just stand up with me just for a moment. Now, I want to see if you can finish this for me. Here's the church, and here's the, and you open it. Hey, did you cover that last week in church? Man, they, they know that. How many of you, it's been 40, 50 years since you learned that? Yeah, I don't, and we don't review it, but we know it. And that's what we're going to do at Walk Through the Bible. Just, I want you to imagine for just a moment that you're standing in a pool of water waist deep. Just run your hands on top of that water. Just run. Now take your hands and put them out in front of you, and imagine you have a huge beach ball out in front. Run your hands around that beach ball. All right, now what I want you to do is put your hands on top of the beach ball and push it down in the water. Now what's going to happen? It's going to pop back. Good job. Have a seat. You did a great job. All right, now I'm, for me to do this, I can't wear this. All right, now what, what you just learned is 10% of what I'm going to teach you this morning. And you're thinking, 10%? Yes, 10%. You just covered 10% of what I'm going to teach you this morning. But first, I hope everyone has a book. Everyone got a book? Turn to page six. If you don't have a book, you need to, they have them around the entrances. You can go get one. Turn to page six. First thing I want to do is I want to share with you how we break up the Old Testament. When I was a kid and went to vacation Bible school, they used to give me one of those little bitty cards, and it had a bookcase on it, and it had all those books in the, you all remember that? And, and it said what each, each uh, grouping of books were. Well, on page six, I want to show you how we break up the Old Testament. you got to remember two numbers. The two numbers you need to remember is five and 17. The first reason you want to remember the, word, the number 17 is because we have 17 books of history in the Old Testament. That's it, 17 books of history. Now, we, have, we also have um, 17 books of prophecy. So books of prophecy and history equal the same number of books. And then we have five books of poetry. 
Now, you, you, you say, okay, so you 17 in two groups, five in one group. That's right. But in the two groups of 17, we have groupings of five. In the books of history, we have what's called the Pentateuch. Say Pentateuch. You know what you just said? Five books. That's what you just said. Pentateuch. Now, if you take five from 17, what do you have left? Yep. We have a really cool name for these other 12 books, too. They are the other historical books. We call the first five the Pentateuch. We call that. All right, anyway, all right. In prophecy, we have the same thing. We have five major prophets. When we say major prophets, we mean that they're more important than the others. No. What we mean is that they wrote longer books. And there's not actually five major prophets. There's five made books of the major prophets because Jeremiah is attributed to two of them. And so that makes us 17 minus 5. How many extra books do we have? We have 12. Minor prophets. They're less important. No, they were all under 18 when they wrote. No, they're just all shorter books. That's it. So on page 6, that's how we break it up. Well, one of the other things that we do is we cover the books of history. We, we talk about what they are and what their key word is. As you look at this slide, I want to ask you a question. Which book of the Old Testament does this slide make you think of? You're going to see images in the slide, but which book is the first question you ask? Which book does it make you think of? Anyone? I heard Isaiah. Anyone else? Jeremiah? Okay, let me ask you, let me ask you, oh my goodness, youth guy, what is the guy doing to the eye? Hug eye. Oh, I got you, Haggai, you got it, Dustin got it right out of the back, all right, Haggai, there you go. So Haggai is the book, but look in the background of the slide and what do you see? You see a building, and what kind of building is that? The temple, that's right, the temple. In Haggai, the people had built paneled houses, but the temple lay in ruin, and God saying, get busy building the temple. Okay, now let, look at this slide and tell me which book this is. Yeah, the eye says, uh, right? Look at the two guys, and, and as you look at the two guys, what are they doing? One of them is praising and glorying, and the other one is weeping and and the key word for for Isaiah is groaning to glory the first uh, 20 the first 39 chapters are about the judgment that's coming because of unfaithfulness and the second 27 chapters are all about the the hope that God's bringing in a suffering servant and so that's one more thing well as you'll look one of the things we do is we cover these six sections it was six sections of the Old Testament in five ways we start with beginnings and I've already started by sharing that with you now take your book and look at page Page nine. Look at page nine. You have blanks there. You see those blanks? Let me warn you, don't fill in those blanks. You're like, there's blanks. I got to fill them in. Don't fill in the blanks. Turn to page 10. Yeah, what I would do with page nine is leave it blank and write on page 10 if you want to. And that way, page nine becomes a memory aid for you in the future. But you have a page there, and this is the, the area of beginnings. When we begin, God, it, what does it say? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Take your hands with, uh, on the bottom of that beach ball. Run your hands around that beach ball and say, creation. Do it with me. Ready? Here we go. Creation. Now, creation, I could talk about that all morning, but what, I'm not going to do that. What, the way I remember creation is through a simple song. Now, in, on the, y'all want to hear my song? Okay. On the first day of creation, the Lord said, let there be light. And then I had the words, that all may see. Have y'all ever heard my song? You've heard the music of it, haven't you? But you don't know the words. I, I, I can't teach the whole thing. Here we go. On the sixth day of creation, the Lord said, Let there be man and beast, fish and fowl, sun, moon and stars, land with plants, water above, water below, and light that all may see. And that is creation. Do that with me. Creation. Here we go. Creation. All right. Now you got to do this with me or you won't learn it. All right. Here we go. One, two, three creation. All right. I think the cool thing about creation is that God created us. You know, when was creation not good? Every day at the end of the day, it said it is. The last day said it is. 
in the middle of the sixth day, he said it is not good. I didn't say it. God said it. You have to get to chapter 2 to explain the sixth day, but God said it is not good for man to be alone. This is one of the things that I think is the most important thing about creation is that God created us for relationship. The funny thing is man wasn't alone, was he? Who was there? God. God said that's not enough. Man doesn't look like me because man's alone. Our God, our unified one God, is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and man was one. And so God didn't create another man. What God do? Took out of man, and he made out of man, woman. And then he said, it is very good. And so we were made for relationship. We were made for each other and for God. All right, do that with me. Ready? Creation. Creation. The problem is the enemy of relationship is sin. God put Adam and Eve in a garden. He told them that they could eat from all the trees of the garden. The serpent came and said, has God said you can't eat from all the trees? God said you can't eat from the trees of the garden. She said, no, God said we can eat from the trees. But the tree that's in the middle of the garden, we can't eat from. He said, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And she looked at it and she saw that it was a delight to the eyes and it was good to make one wise. It was pleasing. It, it was all those things. And she didn't do what God told her, she did what she wanted. And Adam was standing there watching her, and he didn't tell her to stop. And she handed the fruit to Adam. What did Adam do? He ate it. And all of a sudden, they're blaming each other, and they're blaming God. All of a sudden, relationship is spoiled. All of a sudden, creation is spoiled. We call this the fall. So when you have your hands on top of that beach ball, you put them down, you say, fall. So do this with me. Ready? Creation fall. Well, man multiplied on the earth. God sent Adam and Eve out of the garden. Man multiplied on the earth, and their wickedness multiplied on the earth. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. That's the definition of sin. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. And, and God was sorry he had made man, so God called a man who was blameless, a man who did not want to do what was right in his own eyes, a man that wanted to do what was right in God's eyes, and his name was Noah. And God told him to build an ark, invite people into the ark, and he invited people in, but nobody came. The only people that entered the ark was his family. And so there was a 40 days of 40 nights, God brought a flood on the earth. Now, how many of y'all from Mississippi? I met somebody who had relatives from Mississippi. I love the way people from Mississippi talk, because they don't talk like us. Well, I, don't, I know I don't talk like you either. I'm from Oklahoma, so hey. But they say flood. They don't just say flood. They say flood. Say it like you're from Mississippi. Flood. Take your fingers, bubble them up, and bring your hands up and say, flood. All right? Do it again. Flood. So here we go. Ready? Creation, fall, flood. You're doing awesome. Well, they came out of the ark. God took the top of the God. They came out of the ark. They, God gave, here's the cool thing. God gave Noah the exact same instructions he gave Adam and Eve. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and have dominion over it. The exact same instructions. But what happened is man didn't want to fill the earth. In fact, when man began to multiply, they said, let us come together, let us build a city, lest we be scattered. Man was looking to himself and to his own ability and to his own wisdom to live his life rather than looking to God. And so they, were, they, they went to build a city and to build this thing. They were building a tower in that city. And as they built that tower, God began to work in a unique way because God was going to, now he was going to bring judgment, but it was going to be very gracious. It was going to be very gracious. Now, everybody in this section over here, I want you to say the word zest. 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 All right, you're doing great. All right, everybody over here, I want you to say the word nihau. All right, what's your word? And your word is? Nihau. Okay, everybody over here, I want you to say the word namaste. namaste. All right, you did a good job. So yours is? Okay, everybody over here, I want you to say the word? Hmm, I got to teach this to you. You ready? Vicha. Now say stras. Say stras vicha. Good job. Man, they had the hard word, didn't they? So what was your word? What was your word? What was your word? What was your word? Okay, now everybody back here, I want you to say the word konnichiwa. 
Konnichiwa. Y'all are good. Okay, and then everybody right here say bonjour. Bonjour. Oh, bonjour. So everybody was going to work one day, and they got to work, and they all started seeing everybody. And on the count of three, say your word. They were, everybody started to wave, and, and one, two, three, everybody said, yeah. But everybody was like, what did they say? See, y'all spoke in Polish. That's what y'all spoke in. And y'all spoke in, what, what did y'all say? Nihal, Chinese. And y'all spoke in Hindi. And y'all spoke in Russian. And y'all spoke in uh, Japanese. And then you spoke in French. See, when I saved the French for last because everybody knows bonjour. But everybody starts speaking different languages. And that day, God separated the nations. He divided the nations. So take, like you're dividing curtains in a hotel room, say nations. Nations. And so here we go. Ready? Creation, fall, flood, nations. Do it with me again. Ready? Creation, fall, flood, nations. All right, stand up with me. Stand up with me. All right, here we go. Do it again. Ready? Creation, fall, flood, nations. One more time. Creation, fall, flood, nations. Turn to two people and do that two times. Ten minutes. All right, here we go. Ready? Creation, fall, flood, nations. Give yourselves a hand and have a seat. All right. Now, many times you go to a seminar and people put a map on the wall. You see my map? Where's north on my map? It's at the top. Where's south? It's the bottom. Where's east? Right? Where's west? All right, all right. Now, what I want to do is I want to take this map, and I just want to pull it off the screen and put it right, put it right down on the floor underneath you. So now it's underneath you. Now, if I point this way, because we slid the map straight down, which direction is this? And which direction is that? And which direction is that? And which direction is that? Now, I am not even paying attention to those directions, so did they get it right? I think they did. Okay. God started, okay, and which direction is this? Oh, okay. All right. God started a work 4,000 years ago. 4,000 years ago, God started a work way down here in the southeast of our map in a place called Ur. And God started, Ur, at the bottom of Ur is a, a body of water that today we call the Persian Gulf. And he called a man named Abram out of Ur. And Abram traveled up two rivers called Euph the Tigris and Euphrates. And God told Abram, go leave your family and leave your home and go to a place that I will show you. And he said, he promised him, he said, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to bless those who bless you. I'm going to curse those who bless you. But the last thing he said to him is he said, through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Abram traveled to a place up here in the north called Haran, and his father died. His brother lived here. He took his nephew, and he traveled down into a land. Now, this land, we're going to put it right in this aisle. All right, was surrounded by four bodies of water. One body of water right here is the Sea of Galilee. Say that. There's a river that runs out of the Sea of Galilee. It's crooked. It's called the Jordan River. And it's got an oblong body of water down here. Y'all don't move. They're the Dead Sea. Anyway, all right. Now, on the, on the western side, there is a body of water. Y'all wave at the people over there. You've just seen the waves of the Mediterranean. All right. So, this land is where God brought Abraham. Now, God changed his name when he made a covenant from Abram to Abraham. And God took him outside, and he, he said to him, he said this to him, he says, took him outside, he says, now look towards the heavens and count the stars if you're able to count them. He said, so shall your descendants be. And this is our sign for Abraham. What we do is we take our hand and, and take your left hand and just fling those stars up and say, Abraham. Do it with me. Abraham. Our first section of eight things is four events and four people. We've covered the four events. Now we're at the four people, the first one being Abraham. God finally fulfilled his promise to Abraham when he gave him a son through his wife Sarah. Sarah in her 90s, Abraham almost 100 years old, and, and he had Isaac. And so Isaac means laughter, Yitzhak. I don't know if that's how they laughed, Yitzhak, Yitzhak, Yitzhak. I don't know. But anyway, 
It, but grab one star and bring it down and cradle it like a baby and say, Isaac. So, Abraham, Isaac. Now, Isaac, Abraham sent his servant Eleazar up here, up here back to his family place in Padan Aram, that's what they called it eventually. And he came back with a woman named Rebekah, and that became Isaac's wife. They had two sons. One's name was Esau. The other's name was Jacob. Esau lived off the land. He was a burly man. He, he loved to hunt. He loved to do all that. Jacob, he was more domestic. It just means he was a shepherd. And Jacob and Esau didn't get along. They didn't see eye to eye. And um, when, when Isaac wanted to bless Esau, there was a promise that God made about Jacob that the older would serve the younger. And Rebekah remembered that. But Rebekah, this family, and as you read this year through the Old Testament, it's really amazing. This family decided they knew how to fulfill God's will better than God did. Sarah took her maid and gave Hagar to Abraham. And so Abraham had another son. His name was Ishmael. This time, Rebekah said to Jacob, Jacob, go kill a goat. We'll make a stew. You'll take it into your father. You'll sound like your brother. You'll smell like your brother. You'll feel like your brother because the way we'll dress you. And we'll get, your father will bless you instead of Esau. Well, that made Esau very happy. And Esau wanted to kill Jacob. Uh, Daytime TV has nothing on the book of Genesis. Amen? <laughs> I mean, couldn't you just see it? One of those talk shows, here's Esau and here's Jacob, and they're, yeah, he did this. No, he did that. And then there's a fight on the scene. No, I'm just kidding. But that's the kind of thing it is. And so Esau wanted to kill Jacob because he stole. And so Jacob escaped, and he went up here to the, the place where his, his mom was from. He met a girl named Rachel, wanted to marry her. Worked seven years to marry her, but when he went into the marriage tent, the next morning he woke up, he wasn't with Rachel. He was with the older sister, Leah. What comes around goes around. Yeah. He still wanted to marry Rachel, and so he married Rachel. But get this. Not only was he married to two sisters, but the two sisters had maids, and they gave them to Jacob when, he, when they couldn't have children. And so now he has two women that in ancient times you would call concubines. So he has Rachel and Leah and Bilhah and Zilpah, and Rachel finally has a son. His name is Joseph. His father-in-law tries to keep tricking him and keeping him up here. Finally, he, he gets away, and he's, sending, he's going back home. Last time he was at one home, what did Esau want to do? I wanted to kill him. Well, he hears Esau's coming. So he sends one of the maids. He sends another one of the maids with her children. He sends Leah with her children. He sends Rachel with her children. He's left all alone by, by a brook called the Jabbok. And the angel of the Lord shows up. Depending on how you say it, the angel was there or the Lord. And he wrestled with that angel. He said, give me your blessing. Now he not only wanted his father's blessing, but he wanted God's blessing. And he wrestled with the Lord that night. He wrestled with the angel of the Lord. He said, give me, his bless give me your blessing. And he finally would bless Jacob, but he touched his hip and dislocated it. It says the rest of his days he walked on a, a stick the rest of his days as a sign of that God had worked and blessed him. Because he wrestled with the Lord, that's the name of our, our, our sign, is like we're arm wrestling and we say Jacob. So do that with me. Jacob. All right? Jacob. And so we have Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. When he travels back into the land with his wives, Rachel is pregnant again, and she has another son named Benjamin. She wanted to name him Benoni ben because she died giving birth to him. But Jacob changed his name to the son of my right hand, Benjamin. Benjamin, I have a Benjamin, so that I call him the Benjamin. Anyway, um, and so Benjamin, now he has two sons by Rachel. He has Joseph and he has Benjamin. He loves Joseph so much. What does he give Joseph? He gives him a coat of many colors. Just grab, your, grab the cloth of your, your shirt and say, uh, Joseph. Joseph. All right, so here's our four characters. Ready? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Now, I am trying to keep my time. I, I asked people a while ago, I said, have you ever been to a walk through the Bible event? And they said, no. And I said, isn't it amazing your pastor invites somebody to preach for three hours? <laughs> they, they laughed at me too. It's not exactly preaching, but we're telling the story and we're putting it together. 
And Joseph's story, I always feel guilty at this point in my presentation because Joseph's story is so rich. Joseph had some dreams. It's amazing the dreams he had. The dreams he had, the first dream he had was of a, uh, a stock and, and, or these stocks and, and uh, they, his stock rose up erect and the 11 others bowed down to him. He told his brothers and they said, you think we're going to bow down to you? Then he had a dream of, of uh, 12 stars and the sun and the moon. And the sun and the moon and the 12, 11 stars. Actually, it doesn't say 12 stars. It says 11 stars. It says that 11 stars and the sun and the moon bowed down to him. The interesting thing is that dream couldn't come true in his lifetime because his mother was dead. I wonder if that dream could be about somebody else. Someone whom every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Anyway, his brothers resented him because he had these dreams. Even his father said, son, you think I'm going to bow down? Even his father interpreted that dream to mean that he was the son. He says, you think I'm going to bow down? Well, eventually the brothers, they uh, resented him so much that when Jacob sent Joseph to check on his older brothers, they saw him and they stripped him and put him in a cistern, in a pit. And uh, Reuben wouldn't let them mistreat him beyond that, but... While Reuben was away, Judah saw some Midianite traders, some descendants of Ishmael, traveling to Egypt. And they sold him. And so Je Joseph was sold to these traders, and they took him to Egypt. Now Egypt, if this is the Mediterranean Sea, way down here south of the Mediterranean, it, where this brick wall is right here, this is Egypt. This is where he went. You, you need to read the story. It's a great story. Joseph becomes a servant or a slave, he becomes the head slave in a house, then he is, he is falsely accused of rape, then he is thrown in jail, and by the way, he's thrown in the jail that Potiphar, his master, was over, because he was the bodyguard. He, you know, you don't throw a, a rapist in the federal prison, you throw him in the county jail. They go to the state pen. But he was thrown into the federal prison. He went into Pharaoh's prison, where Potiphar was over it. And then he became the head trustee. That means he was the prisoner who had all, all the authority. Two of the prisoners came in. They were, they were accused of trying to kill Pharaoh. Uh, this happens a lot around the world today. Everybody goes to jail. It doesn't matter whether you're innocent or guilty. They put you in jail and then they sort it out. And that's what, the, that's what Pharaoh did. He put the cupbearer, he put the baker in jail, and then he sorted it out. They had dreams. Pharaoh, Joseph interpreted their dreams. His interpretation was true. The cupbearer was restored. The baker was executed. And Joseph's last words were, remember me. It took a few years, but Pharaoh had a dream and nobody could interpret it. And the cupbearer remembered Joseph. He said, I, I know a man. He's in prison. He interpreted my dream. Brought him out. Pharaoh interpreted, I mean, Joseph interpreted the dream, told Pharaoh what to do. And Pharaoh said, I need a man who can do what you just interpreted. He made Joseph the prime minister of Egypt. Talk about a career path, huh? I mean, he goes from being the favored son to being the despised brother to being a slave to being a prisoner to being prime minister. We, that should happen the opposite way in our country, huh? <laughs> For some people. But that's how God does it. And that's how God works. He never uses the career path we would imagine. He always uses it. And, and that's what he did with Joseph. And so Joseph winds up being the prime minister of Egypt. The only person over him is Pharaoh. So say Joseph. When Jacob died, they went and buried Jacob. The brothers came back to Joseph and said, Joseph, your, your father told you told us to tell you, you know, don't hold these things against us. And what did Joseph say? He said, men, what God meant for evil, what men means for evil, God means for good. And he forgave his brothers. At the beginning of Genesis, you find sin. At the end of Genesis, you find forgiveness. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. All right, stand up with me. Let's review that. Look at this picture right here. What book is this? Genesis, what is the key word to the book of Genesis? What looks out of the ordinary? The end is what? Getting bigger. It's a big end. 
So that's the key word to the book of Genesis is beginnings. It's the beginning of Actually, it's what Genesis means, beginning. It's the beginning of family. It's the beginning of dysfunctional family. It's the beginning of law. It's the beginning of everything begins in Genesis. Sin, everything. So, all right, so let's do Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Do that again, ready? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Do that two times with your neighbors. All right, here we go. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. All right, let's do Genesis. Ready? Creation, fall, flood, nations. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Give yourselves a hand and have a seat. All right, we're going to start a new section. It's the section called Wanderings. Now, here's the thing. I told you we're going to be together about three hours. We have 39 books to cover, and we've covered one in 30 minutes. How are we doing? <laughs> All right? But it's going to start to move a little faster. That is the shortest amount of time I've ever taught Genesis. I usually run over. So they're in Egypt, and they're there for 400 years. And the people are... Uh, the. A Pharaoh rises up who doesn't know Joseph, and so he gets fearful of how many Hebrews there are, how many people from Israel there are. And so he begins to put them into bondage and make them build cities and do all of that. The people start to cry out to God and say, asking God to bring rescue for them. God raises up someone to rescue. Pharaoh wants all the little boys killed, and he tells the midwives to kill them as they're born. And the midwives won't do it. They fear God. And so then he tells all the mothers to cast their children into the Nile. They believe the Nile was divine. And they cast them into the Nile. And all the mothers were doing that. And one mother said, I'm not going to do it. She took her child and she nursed him until he was weaned. She built a little ark. She put him out in the water. The princess of Egypt found him and drew him out of the water. That's his name, out of water. What's his ancient name? Moses. Y'all like to speak those ancient languages, don't you? All right. His, his, his name means out of water. That's who he was. His name was Moses. He grew up in Pharaoh's household. He had a royal upbringing. He had all of the education of the royal family. When he, when he was a man, he saw a, an Egyptian beating a, a Hebrew. He went to intervene to stop it and ended up killing the Egyptian, hid the Egyptian in the sand. He saw two Hebrews arguing. He went to intervene and tell them, don't argue, brothers. And one of them says, what are you going to do? Kill me like you killed the Egyptian? I don't care who you are. You murder people, you're going to be scared of the consequences. And Moses was scared of the consequences. And he left Egypt and he traveled down south of the promised land into a wilderness. He met a priest there. He married a one of his daughters. He tended the flock 40 years. And he saw a bush. As a shepherd, he had a staff. Remember, God told him, as that bush burned but it wasn't consumed, take your shoes off. You know, He told him, throw down that staff. And he threw it down and it became a snake and he told him pick it up y'all pick up snakes here in texas they rattle don't they yeah and he picked it up and it became a staff again and that's our that's our sign for moses pick up that staff and say moses now listen he's the greatest leader moses do it with me right moses and Moses, God had a message for Moses. He said, go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. He gave him 10 audio visuals to help Pharaoh understand how important it was. In the Bible, they're called plagues. But what they were is they discredited every one of the Egyptian gods. It was really awesome. And God showed His authority over all that man believes. And, and, and finally, the last one, God said that, that uh, He was going to send death into the land told the Hebrews, told them to put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of their house. And so they were to put that blood on the doorpost of their house. And God would pass over that doorpost and the, and the destroyer couldn't visit it. He couldn't do it. And, and they'd be saved. 
But if the destroyer came, the firstborn in every house would die. Well, in Egypt that night, the firstborn of every household in Egypt died. And it was a terrible thing. And Pharaoh said, get out. So take your, take your hand and put the blood on the doorpost and say, Passover. 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 And so we have Moses and we have Passover. Well, the next thing that happened was Pharaoh said, get out. They crossed the Red Sea. Pharaoh went into the sea and God closed the sea up on him. They went back to Sinai where Moses had seen that bush and God gave them the parameters for a relationship with him. He gave them the law. And so make two tablets with your hands and say law. Law. And God gave them the law because God, God wanted to relate to them. The first four were about their relationship with God. The last six were their relationship with each other. And 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 that the way it is. God God created man to have a relationship with him, but also to have a relationship with each other. That relationship. He was restoring that relationship with this nation. And he, he was giving them the law to do that. After he gave them the law, he said, Now I'm going to come and meet with you. I'm going to live among you. I'm going to dwell among you. And I'm going to give you a place that I'm going to dwell among you. And that's going to be called, and, and do it like the church with the steeple. We're going to call it the tabernacle. Tabernacle. And God gave them the tabernacle. He said, I'm giving you a place where I will come and dwell with you. And that's the tabernacle. So do this with you. Ready, Moses? Moses, Passover, law, tabernacle. And God, what He was doing was He was establishing, he was establishing His relationship with this new group. They went from Abraham and his wife and Isaac, to 70 people who moved to Egypt, to now to possibly a couple million people who came out of Egypt. And he says, I want to live in relationship with you as a group of people. And that's what he was doing. And he gave them the law, and then he gave them the place he would meet. Stand up with me. Stand up with me. You're thinking, why are we standing again? Because we got four. Ready? Here, let's do this. Ready? Moses, Passover, law, Tabernacle. Do it with me again. Ready? Moses, Passover, Law, Tabernacle. Do that a couple times with your neighbors. All right, let's do that together. Here we go. Moses, Passover, Law, tabernacle have a seat y'all are doing wonderful all right everything everything that we just covered is in what book what'd you say exodus, exodus. all right exodus and what's the key word to the book of exodus exit God brought them out of their bondage and into a relationship with Him. They exited Egypt. And that's it. Everything that we just covered is in Exodus. Everything we covered the first eight were in Genesis. Everything that we just covered was in Exodus. We did pretty good. We're gaining some ground, right? And, and so God began to develop that relationship. What was the most important event in the New Testament? We always like to say like the, the birth, but the birth really didn't get us anywhere, did it? What got us somewhere? The death, burial, and resurrection. What's the most important event in the Old Testament? Everybody wants to say creation, but we messed that up. So what was the next most important event? The Passover. The Passover, because God redeemed His people. And if you take the the cross of Christ, and you take the Passover, you have two events. The, the Passover foreshadows the cross. It, it, look up on the screen with me. What, what we do is we call this the Passover principle. Um, you don't need to write anything, so just enjoy looking at the screen. Don't worry about your book, because I give this all to you. It's all written in there, so you don't have to fill anything out. But when we apply the Passover principle, we look at five things about the Old Testament, and then we look at five things about the New Testament. In the Old Testament, there was an instruction, take a lamb and kill it. In the New Testament, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming and he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He announced that Jesus is that Lamb. 
Now, now look at the condition of the sacrifice. Moses told the people, your lamb shall be without blemish. The condition in the New Testament was, the, Peter said, the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Jesus meets that condition. L- look, at, look at number three, the reason. The reason is God will execute judgment. God is not unjust. He's just when He executes judgment. In the New Testament, in Hebrews it tells us, it is appointed for men to die once, and then comes the judgment. Judgment's coming for every man. Judgment was coming for Israel. It was coming for Egypt, for every man. But then there's the application. Every man shall take for himself a lamb. Every man in every household was to take a lamb, put it on the blood, the blood on the doorpost of the house. In the New Testament, I love this verse out of Acts, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It's the blood of the Lamb. And, and so, the result in the Old Testament is the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. Who passes over the door? The Lord does. He's the shield. He's the protection. Look at in the New Testament. In Romans 8, there is there now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because Christ Jesus now, He's the one who covers our lives. He's the one who enters our lives. And death has no victory. Death has no sting. Um, I pastored in South Louisiana, and in South Louisiana, everybody's Catholic. Um, Whether they go to a Catholic church or not, their family's Catholic, so they're Catholic. I had a friend named Ken. I tell this story about him with his permission. He had pancreatic cancer, and he was dying, and I had to go to the hospital one day and visit him, and he he was a Catholic. He, He was a mortgage broker, or not a mortgage broker, he was a real estate broker in the parish that I was pastoring in, and he was the the real estate broker. Everybody knew Ken. The major family. Everybody knew the major family. And um, I went and I said, God, if I ask Ken if he believes in Jesus, he's going to say yes. If I ask him if he's ever been born again, he's not going to know what to do with that. I said, give me a question, God. And God gave me a question. He said, he gave me the question. I went in and I said, Ken, when did you choose what you believe? When did it become what, how you responded to God? And he goes, what do you mean? And I said, well, you're Catholic, right? He goes, I'm Catholic, yeah. I said, well, why are you Catholic? You were born and your family was Catholic. He said, that's right. I said, now you went to First Communion. Who, who told you to go first? Was that what you chose? No, that's what my family chose. You were Christian. Now, who chose that for you? He said, well, my family did. And I said, well, you went through catechism. Did you want to go to catechism? He said, no, I didn't want to go to catechism. My parents made me go to catechism. I said, so everybody else has chosen religion for you. I said, when did you choose what you believe? He said, I don't have an answer for you. Three weeks later, I went to, I, well, I told him that day, I said, that's not good. I didn't feel like it was the time to go any further. Three weeks later, I went to his house, and he goes, Randy, I got an answer for you now. I said, what's that answer? He said, last night, my wife, he said, every night, my wife and I have been reading through the Bible. He's dying. They gave him three months. He said, we were reading through the Bible every night. We came across this little pamphlet in her Bible, and we read through it, and it was about how God loves us and Jesus died for our sin. He said, there was a prayer in the back, and I prayed, I mean it. I, I've come to believe that over the last six years since I've been sitting in your teaching. And I said, Ken, that's great, because every man shall take for himself a lamb. Because Jesus died for every man. My, I was eight years old. I was in a Baptist church. Never sat on the back row. Never, ever sat on the back row. We came to revival, got there late, sat on the back row, and that night, from the back row, for some reason, I understood the gospel for the first time. I'd heard it a lot because my family chose it for me. But that night, I responded to Jesus. Have you ever responded? See, they had to take the blood of the Lamb and put it on the doorpost. You have to take the promise of Christ and invite Him into your life. That's what you have to do. See, that's why you need a Passover. In fact, there's a verse Paul said it this way in Corinthians. He said, for indeed Christ, our Passover lamb, was sacrificed for us. We put the word lamb in there because Passover. He's the one who enters our life and protects us. You have to invite him in. Let, let me pray for you right now. Father, I come to you right now.
I pray for everyone in this room, and I ask you, Lord, just to show your grace in abundance, that they would have the keen awareness, the keen understanding of your love for them. And that they may have been part of this church for decades, or they may have just been in church all their life with their family, but Lord, they've never entered that relationship with you because you created them for that relationship. Jesus, you died for them to restore that relationship to overcome their sin. Lord, we thank You that You've done that. Lord, help them not to doubt, but to have faith. Help them to invite You to help them with their faith. And help them to put their trust and faith in You, in You alone. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your book for just a moment in there. I told you you didn't need to turn there, but it has these those questions and it has all of these verses but at the very bottom it has that little prayer see this isn't a decision i can make for you pastor can't make it for you none of the ministers or deacons or teachers can make it for you every one of us has to make it for ourselves we have to respond to god's invitation we have to open the gift that he's given us in jesus christ and that's what this is all about what god is doing in the old testament is he is moving creation towards his son Jesus Christ. And the Passover was the clearest picture at this point. It was the clearest picture at this point. All right, well, let's move on. As we continue through the story, they're still at Mount Sinai. And what God does is He says, Now at the tabernacle, what do you do? He gave them priests to serve, the Levites to oversee and to take care of, and priests to serve. But He says, When you come to the tabernacle, there are two things you do. The first, he calls offerings. So you put your left hand in there and say offerings. Offerings. I, I, we like offerings. They, they help, but not the same thing. What they called offerings was their sacrifices. They had a burnt offering, and they had a wave offering, they had a votive offering. They had all kinds. I love burnt offerings. In fact, when I first got married, my wife brought me a burnt offering every night. <laughs> I'm just teasing. <laughs> Don't tell her. I, no, she knows. No, but do you ever get home from work and you open your car door and somebody out there is burning meat? That smells good. Offerings are very important. I, there's two offerings that I would call your attention to. One is called the guilt offering and one is called the sin offering. The guilt offering, have you ever committed a sin and not meant to or not known you did it? But later you go, oh my goodness, I did that? That's what the guilt offering was for. It was for sin that you didn't intend to commit. But the sin offering was for the sins. Sometimes you just go ahead and say it, don't you? I shouldn't have said it. I knew I shouldn't have said it, but I just had to say it. I just did it because I wanted to. Well, that's what it's about. The sin offering. And so what he does is he gives us these offerings. He says, this is it. Now, here's the beautiful thing. A lot of people, as people read through the Bible this year, they're going to think, why in the world am I reading about killing all these animals? Because these offerings are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jesus fulfills all of these offerings that God gives in the Old Testament. If you want to know the richness of the cross and the richness of its practicality to us, understand the offerings of the Old Testament. Because they're why God sent His Son to die for us. He died for our guilt. He died for our sin. He died for our depravity, our wickedness, our brokenness. He died for our hopelessness. All of those things are revealed in these offerings. And it's great. So put, one hand, put your left hand up and say, offerings. Now, in the Old Testament, that's the one thing I always thought. If people say, why, you want to study the Old Testament, say, why do you want to study about commands and about uh, sacrifices? Because that's all the Old Testament is. But it's not. Because what God did now is He said, when you come to the tabernacle, you're going to celebrate some feast." Because the feasts are a celebration of our relationship. And our, their relationship was not based on their faithfulness to God. It was based on God's faithfulness to them. God gave them. He gave them first from the very beginning of creation. He gave them a day to rest. And that's one of their feasts. Every week, Jewish people celebrate this Passover or the, the Sabbath. They celebrate that. They have the Passover. They have, the, they have other feasts. And so the feasts were His faithfulness. This, the offerings take care of our shortcomings. The feasts celebrate His faithfulness. Don't we celebrate people today? Happy birthday. We celebrate birthdays. We celebrate anniversaries. We celebrate people. 
We do that as believers. We celebrate God's goodness. We're getting ready to celebrate thankfulness for the blessings of God upon our culture and our society and our country at Thanksgiving, right? And so put your, put your left hand up and say offerings. Put your right hand up and say feast. So we have offerings and feast. All right, now what book is this? Leviticus. Do you know why it's Leviticus in this picture? Because it's the left foot he kiss. All right, left foot he kiss. So Leviticus, all right. So what's the key word for the book of Leviticus? Offerings, feasts. That's what you see on the slide. All right, the next thing is they leave Sinai. Well, before they leave Sinai, they count everybody. They take a census. Now, who do they count? They count all of the men 20 years and older. Do you know why they did that? We do the same thing. We don't do 20 years and older. We do 18 and older. Selective service. That's what they did. They did the selective service. So they counted everybody except the Levites. They counted everybody else, 20 years and older. They came to a place called Kadesh. Now Kadesh was a place where there was water and vegetation in the middle of the desert. What do you call that? Oasis. At Kadesh, they sent spies into the land. The spies were supposed to look for two things. One, they were supposed to look at how good the land was. And number two is, can we take them? Can we defeat the inhabitants of the land? Well, they went into the land, 12 spies. They came out of the land, and they all agreed the land is awesome. They did. They said, how's the land? It's great. We're all in agreement. It's great. All right, now can we take them? Two of them went, yeah, we can take them. Let's go. Ten of them went, wait a minute, we're not with those guys. They said, these people are, we're like grasshoppers to them. There's no way we can defeat them. And that day was a sad day in Israel because they did what most groups do. They went with the majority. And they went with man's majority rather than God's majority. And when they went with that, God sent them back into the wilderness. So what we do, I'm, I'm, I'm getting excited about the story here. Take your right hand and say counting, spying. Because that's the first thing they did. That's one thing. Counting, so counting, spying. Because they wouldn't obey, God sent them back into the wilderness for 40 years. In those 40 years, everybody 20 years and older died in the wilderness. And we call that wandering. And when people die in, a, in an Old Testament event, uh, we put our hand over our heart, we bow our head and say dying. So wandering and dying. So we have counting, spying, wandering, dying. All right, look at this book. What book did we just cover? No, numbers. Now, what's the key word to the book of Numbers? What do you see those numbers doing? They're wondering. That's right. They got a map and a compass and sunglasses and sweat. and They're wondering. And that's the key word to the book of Numbers is wondering because that's what the people did. They disobeyed God and they just wondered. They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know where they were going. They had nowhere to go. And so that's what they did. So, Counting, counting, spying, wandering, dying. All right, now, the next thing that happened is they didn't come back to Kadesh. They traveled around the Dead Sea to the east, and they came over here on the east side of the Jordan River to a place called Moab. Moab. Now, in Moab, Moses stopped, and he did something that they had not done before. What he did, scholars tell us that Moab, it, that, that Moses preached three sermons. That's what scholars tell us. He preached three sermons. Now, let me ask you a question. If you were 49, let me say this. If you were 59 at Moab, how old were you at Kadesh? 19. You were 19. All right. If you're 41 in Moab, how old were you at Kadesh? So you take the number minus 40, because that's how long they were in the wilderness. So here's a whole generation. If you were 25 at Moab, how old were you at Kadesh? You weren't born. You don't remember Egypt. You don't remember Sinai. You don't remember any of those things. This, this is 
this is what's going on. A new generation is hearing the law. See, their, their families wouldn't trust God, so they wandered in the wilderness and died. How many of you think of them were happy about that? How many of you think of them said, God gave us the law, I'm going to teach it to you? No. If you read Numbers, all they did was moan and groan and complain at God and at God's servant. And so what God did is He took them to Moab. He had to teach them the law again so that they would follow. And it's the second law. He taught them the law again. What book is this? Deuteronomy. In fact, Deuteronomy means second law. Dudo nomos. Second law. This is the book Deuteronomy. What's the key word? Second law. That's it. Second law. And so what we do is we put two fingers up and we say second law. Not another law, but the law again. All right? So second law. Law. And so Moses gives them the law a second time, but it's a law to a new generation before they would enter the promised land. Isn't that amazing? What is one of the hardest things to do? To give the promises of God to the next generation to bank on them, to live them out, to seek God's promises. I love, I love God's promises. Listen, I have six children. My oldest is 22. My youngest is six. We have a practice in our home. If we're going to Disney... We don't give our children more than 48 hours of warning. You know why? Because they will believe me. And when they believe me, for the next 60 days, if I tell them two months in advance, they say, Dad, now when we get there, are we going to stay at Disney? Or are we going to stay outside Disney? Dad, are we going to ride the train? Are we going to have a shuttle bus? Are we going to drive in every day and sit in that long line? Dad, are we going to go to the Magic Kingdom first? Or are we going to get to go to Epcot first? Or do we get to go to that Animal Kingdom? Now, when we go to the Animal Kingdom, Dad, is this... And they just drive me crazy. How many of us read the promises of God and drive God crazy with His promises? Wow. Do we believe His Word? My children believe mine. Do we believe His? Do we say, God, these are your promises? Mm. All right, let's stand up. (laughs) We have just finished the law. Isn't that good? All right, here we go. Let's do, uh, let's do offerings, offerings, feast, counting, spying, wandering, dying, second law. All right, let's do it again. Ready? Offerings, feast, counting, spying, wandering, dying, second law. Law. All right, now let's go back to Moses. Ready? Here we go. Ready? Moses, Passover, law, tabernacle, offerings, feast, counting, spying, wandering, dying, second law. All right, am I over time? I am right on time. All right, I need, what do you call them? I forgot. First, first impressions, would you come forward? I need you to help me. They're going, do we have to do motions? Come, no, just come forward while we do this last time. I, hurry up. I've got books up here I want you to hand out to every family during the break, okay? First impressions, come. No. Greeters. Greeters, come forward. All right, y'all can start grabbing books. Here we go, ready? <laughs> Creation, fall, flood, nations, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Passover, law, tabernacle, offerings, feast, counting, spying, wondering, dying, second law. Give yourselves a hand. While uh, y'all are passing the plate, the folks who are new, uh, you've missed 16 things out of 40. Do y'all want to help them? If the plate's already gone past you, Then let's go ahead. What is this? Creation. Creation. What is this? And then? And then? And this is? And this is? And this is? Now that is Genesis. All right, so let's do that a little quicker. Here we go. Ready? Creation, fall, flood, nations, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, 
Joseph. All right? Now, you'll catch on. It gets easier as it goes on. Now, in, the, in Exodus, we have... And then the... And the... And the... Okay, so that's Exodus. Let's do that again. Ready? And then we in Leviticus, we have... All right, one more time in Leviticus. And then in Numbers, we have... All right, one more time in Numbers. And then in Deuteronomy, we have... All right, let's put that together. All right. Now, y'all are getting better at this, so let's speed it up a little bit, all right? Here we go. Ready? Crazy fall flood nation. That's a little fast. <laughs> Throw my... All right. All right. Stand up with me. Let's do this together. Here we go. Ready? Creation, fall, flood, nations, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Passover, law, tabernacle, offerings, feast, counting, spying, wandering, dying, second law. Give yourselves a hand and have a seat. All right, now, something happens in the language. In Deuteronomy, God starts speaking a little differently. Here's the thing. Look at what he says in Deuteronomy 5.29. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always that it may be well with them and with their sons forever. Look at this next verse. You shall love the Lord your God with all your and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. There you go. All right. And so we start seeing this word come up in the New Testament more and I mean the Old Testament more and more. All right. Well, now we enter a new section. Now walk through the Bible when I show the video. I'm supposed to talk about it's in 140 countries, over 30,000 active instructors, over 30 million people. Uh, impacted. And you can connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or Instagram. And so we are entering the promised land now. This is exciting. The people finally get to go in, and God is taking them in a new way. Now, God takes them in with a new leader. Now, here's the thing. His name is Joshua. He's not a priestly leader. He's a military leader. We've seen Joshua before because he was one of the two spies that said, let's go into the land. And so here's Joshua. You ready? Joshua. Joshua. So, salute. When I was at Fort Hood, Texas, I got corrected because my salute was, you know, just salute. And they said, no, nope, it's like this. Two weeks ago, I was at a church and a Marine walked up to me and said, no, sir, that's Army. This is Marines. I was like, I can't win. <laughs> so say Joshua. Ready? Joshua. Now Joshua, they've entered, they crossed through the Jordan River. God held back the Jordan River. They crossed through it. They came to that first city. What was that city? Jericho. God told them walk around it seven days. Seven times seven days. The walls came down and they defeated the city. Isn't that a great battle plan? Walk around the city. It's over. Hey, in my church in Oklahoma, when I was growing up, we owned the post office, and we rented it to the United States Post Office. We wanted it. They'd moved out of it, but they had like a 50-year lease. They wouldn't give it to us. One Sunday night, the pastor said, we're walking, and we walked around that building, and we held hands and prayed. That next week, they gave us the post office. It's a good battle plan. <laughs> and that became our family life center. It was exciting. Well... As we enter the promised land, this is a short season. There's only a few books in it, but one of the things is it's very interesting because it's, it's different. Now, you, you think of, of entering the promised land. Now, what did they do? They walked around Jericho, but after that, God gave them a different battle plan. God told them, he said, here's what you do. Now, see, remember, this is the whole land. This is the north end of the land. This is the south end of the land. And what God said is you need to divide this land in half, and you need to conquer it. Have you all ever heard that before? Divide and conquer? You didn't know it came out of the Bible, did you? Yeah, so what we do is we say divide, conquer. All right, so do that with me. Divide, 
conquer. Y'all did okay, but you mm, conquer. Right? Divide and conquer. And so they, they, they conquered the south first, and then they conquered the north. Well, then they not only divided it and conquered it, but then they settled all 12 tribes in the land. They settled all 12 tribes in the land. So take your hands out, act like you're cutting something up, and say, 12 tribes, 12 tribes. Listen, if your voice isn't going up and down, you're not doing it right. All right, here we go. Twelve tribes. All right, so here we go. Ready? Joshua, divide, conquer, twelve tribes. You know, that's a pretty simple way to cover Joshua. Joshua only messed up two times. You think, what do you mean, messed up? Well, after they conquered Jericho, some guys came to him and said, hey, AI's next. It's very small. Just take a small group of people. We can defeat it. And he went. And they were defeated by Ai. And then he went to the Lord and said, Lord, what happened? And the Lord said, listen, Joshua, you, there's sin in your camp. See, the Lord would have told him there was sin in the camp if Joshua had asked. But Joshua assumed he could just go do like he thought. And uh, so he didn't seek the Lord the first time. Second time was a group of people from inside the land lied and said, we're from a far country and we don't want to have a problem with you. Make a covenant with us. He didn't ask the Lord if he should make that covenant. He made the covenant and the Gibeonites were a thorn in their side the rest of their days because they couldn't defeat them. And you say, why was it so important that they defeat the people in the land? Because the people in the land did not know God, did not seek God, did not desire to seek God. And, and they only desired to destroy Israel. Y- y'all ever know the song Beulah Land? Yeah. We sing the song Beulah Land and we sing it correlating the promised land to heaven. Listen, I hope heaven is not like the promised land. Because the promised land was a difficult place. In fact, our Beulah land is not heaven. It is a promised life. Remember, the Passover is a foreshadowing of the cross, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? The promised land is a foreshadowing of a promised life that you and I live. When we come to Christ, He doesn't give us 40 acres and a mule. He gives us a life. I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. When you read Joshua, what you're reading is how God takes people into a godless place and fulfills His promises to them. Your life and my life is a godless place until we meet Jesus. And then He wants His promises to come and bear out in our life. Amen? And all of the challenges that Israel faced in in the book of Joshua, we're going to face because we're dealing with the same sinful thing that rules the land, rules the life. And we're trying to turn this life, this land over to God. Isn't that good? And so we have to divide up and say, listen, I can't live this way anymore. The Bible says this, I've got to live differently. And so we conquered new areas of our life. Remember my heart, Christ home? God goes in and cleans out every room and makes it his own. That's our heart. That's what the promised land is. All right, do it with me. Ready? Joshua, divide, conquer, 12 tribes. All right, what book? We just went through um, Joshua, okay? And the book is next. What book? What book? Joshua. What's the key word to the book of Joshua? Conquers. Yeah, that's not Momar, Fidel. Uh, that's Joshua standing over Jericho. <laughs> and so the key word to the book of Joshua, what I love about, at the end of Joshua, here's what Joshua says. He said, then put away your foreign gods that are among you and incline your heart to the Lord. Isn't that good? Even Joshua leads the people to incline their heart to the Lord. Well, okay. So the next thing that happens is we enter a time, uh, we have a big picture. You say, what's the big picture? Well, sometimes, have you, ever, have you ever noticed that when you get on top of a skyscraper and you look down at a city, it looks very different than if you're walking on the street? Most of the time when we study the Bible, we walk on the street. Because we walk through this verse and that verse and that passage. But what we do when we get at walk through the Bible is like we're in an airplane looking down. Every time I fly into Tulsa, Oklahoma, I look and I go, oh, that's where my mom lives. It's down there. That's, that's the interstate. That's the expressway. And there's that country highway. And that's where my mom. And I look at it in relationship. There's my old high school. There's that. And I see, well, that's what we're doing with the Bible. We have a thing called the teach test principle. And you can look at the screen. It's all written in your book. You don't need to write anything down. But we say, okay, if you take that 30,000, that 32,000 foot look from 
at the first five books of the Bible, what do you see? Well, in Genesis, people were enslaved. At the beginning, they were enslaved spiritually, and at the end, they were enslaved physically. They wound up in Egypt, and they wound up enslaved. In Exodus, God redeemed his people. In Leviticus, he taught them. He said, this is our relationship. This is how we relate to one another. In Numbers, he tested them. Did they pass or did they fail? They failed. What does that mean, they failed? They didn't trust God. They didn't live out the relationship. Trust is the foundation of a relationship. They didn't live out that trust. And so in Deuteronomy, he brings them back to Moab. What's he do again? He teaches them. And then in Joshua, they're retested. You know, you look at that and you say, well, Randy, that's cool. But what does that mean? God never asks us to trust him unless he's taught us. What's the first thing you have to learn about God? He loves you. He loves you so much he demonstrated that love through his son, Jesus Christ. Now you're going to trust him. But then you go to church or you read your devotional. You go to Sunday school or Bible study. You listen to a sermon. God's teaching you. Here's the surprising thing. If God's teaching you about something, he's going to give you a chance to trust him. He's going to give you the chance. It's not going to be, it's not a question. So the question really is, what's God been teaching you lately? Oh, because if he's been teaching you, get ready. We called it a test up here, but it's just an opportunity to trust him. For me, I grew up in church, loved God, loved church, loved youth group, loved the ministry. I spent, I'd, I'd actually get out of school, drive down the street, because our church was on the same street, drive down the street, stop at the church, see the youth minister, how things go, and spend as much time as I could there before I had to go to work, because I loved it so much. And one Sunday night, sitting with the young people, after disciple now, holding on to that back pew, God said, I want to use you in ministry. I said, no, you don't have to do that, God. <laughs> he said, I want to use you. I said, no, no. See, I, I was so proud of my spiritual life. I said, God, I can be just like my dad. My dad's a deacon, and he's a Sunday school teacher. He's a soul winner. He, he serves people. He, he, I'd be just like my dad. I had two friends that walked the aisle and said, God's called us a special service, and then they went out and lived like the world. I said, I'm better than them, God. I failed. Two years of wondering. God brought me back and taught me. The next time he called me, I said, I don't want to fail anymore. We all go through it. The disciples, Jesus teaches the disciples, they get in a boat to cross the lake. A storm comes up. Where's Jesus? Sleeping. He's not going to die. That's not his destiny. A boat is not his destiny. But the disciples are shaking him going, don't you care that we're dying here? He says, my favorite line, oh, you of little faith. Y'all didn't get that, did you? We're in Texas. Oh, you. Oh, I'm no sooner. I'm a cowboy. All right. He says, oh, you have little faith. See, they didn't trust him. They didn't trust that he taught them to trust him. The question for you is, what's God been teaching you lately? And then the question is, now, what do you need to do to trust him to fulfill that teaching and to go on with the learning process? So many people get stuck in kindergarten spiritually. Because they never get, they never learn the basic things they need to learn and trust him to walk out of them. Let, let me pray for us right now. Father, I come to you right now, and, and this is a powerful, a powerful lesson for us. Because it's not about just trusting you to have eternal life. But it's about trusting you and then growing into that life. And believing your promises and trusting you and living it out. Because that's what you've called us to, Lord. I pray that every person in this room, whatever you're teaching them, Whatever you're teaching me right now, Lord, that you would help us to trust you. Whether it's something we have to do on our own or whether it's something we do in partnership as the body of Christ, fellowshipping together in service. But we trust you and we move forward in faithfulness. Because you've been faithful to us. Now are we going to be full of faith towards you? Help us to do that, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. The next place we go is Judges. Now, what book is this? The book of Judges. Now, what's the key word to the book of Judges? What doesn't fit in that picture? You're like, this is Old Testament. What's in that picture that doesn't fit? 
Yeah, motorcycle, but there's not just one. There's multiple cycles, and that's the key word to the book of Judges. Judges is a hard book to understand. A lot of people get into it, and they're like, man, that just doesn't make any sense to me. doesn't edify my Christian life, so I don't want to read it. But here's what's happening. Once they got into the promised land, how are they going to live faithfully to God in the promised land? They didn't do a great job. Once you get into the promised life, how are you going to live faithfully trusting God in the promised life? See, the number seven is on the motorcycle because there are seven cycles that they went through. There are seven cycles, and this is the cycle of the judges. The first cycle is they were supposed to trust God, live before Him as their king, but they would sin. And then they would enter into servitude. Here's the thing. If you sin, you always become a slave in that area of your life. So if you're a liar and you tell lies, you're going to be a slave to your lies. If you abuse some kind of substance, you're going to be a slave to that substance. That's what happens. And so what they would become a slave to, say, the Canaanites or the Philistines or the Amorites or any of those people. And God, they would cry out to God and they'd say, God, save us. Because that's all that we can do is cry out, God, save us. And God would raise up a judge who would bring salvation and they, he would save them, and then the silence would come back. Well, are you going to trust me? Because that's what trusting is. It's trust. He said it. You know, once you say something, you just let people, are they going to do it or not? And that was the silence. Seven times they went through this. Seven times. Now, wh when we say judges, what we do is we say, we say 12 tribes, and make a gavel with your hand, and say judges. So, Twelve tribes, judges. Now, we talk about three of the 12, 13 judges, however you want to break them up. We talk first about a judge who was an unlikely judge because she was a she. There you go. Her name was Deborah. Y'all know her? She was a prophetess, and she was prophesying in Israel. And a, a, a general named Barak came to her, and he said, Listen, if we go fight the enemy, are we going to win? She said, You're going to win. Go fight the enemy. He said what every little boy says on the playground. I'll go if you go. <laughs> she said, I'll go with you, but you're not going to get the credit. So they go fight. They start winning. The opposing general, his name is Sisera, he runs away. Where does he run? He runs to a tent. There's a lady there. She's a housewife. He says, would you hide me? She says, sure, come in. She puts... First, she gives him some milk and stuff. She puts him under a skin. He's sitting there. He's afraid. She goes outside, finds a tent peg, finds a hammer, comes back in. There's his head. A housewife killed the opposing general. Deborah. Isn't that good? So, um, so rub the back of your head. Women have beautiful hair, so we note Deborah by that, and we say Deborah. Deborah. So, 12 tribes, judges, Deborah. All right, we have another one. Another young man, he was of no account family, no account tribe, small community. God told him to tear down an altar. He goes at night. Now, he brings some help with him. He tears down the Baal altar. God says, okay, I want you to free my people. He says, God, I'm not sure that's what you want me to do. He says, if I put this skin on the ground, this fleece, and tomorrow morning the skin is wet and the ground is dry, I'll know this is what you want me to do. Next morning he gets up, takes the skin, rings it out. Guess what? Moisture comes out of it. Now, I don't know if he thought his Ezekiel's dog had visited the skin, or I'm just kidding, but he doubted. He doubted God. And he's put the skin on the ground, and he said, now, God, tomorrow if the skin is dry and the ground is wet, I'll know this is what you want me to do. Next day, took the fleece, wrung it out, nothing came out of it. So it called everybody to war. 32,000 men came to war. Now their enemy was 100,000. 32,000 against 100,000. God says, you got too many men. Wait a minute, the odds are one to three, right? Isn't that the ratio? One Israelite for every three of the opposing army. He says, you got too many. Tell everybody who doesn't want to fight, go home. He goes, okay, guys, if you don't want to fight, go home. 22,000 men went home. He had 10,000 men. Now the odds are not 1 to 3. They're 1 to 10. God says, you got too many men. Take them down to the brook, the brook of Herod, and he, he said, tell them to get a drink. Everybody that drinks out of their hand, keep, and everybody that sticks their face in the water, send home. 
It was a sad day in Israel, my friend. Those mamas were embarrassed because 9,700 men stuck their face in the water like a dog instead of like a, a wise soldier who would drink and keep his eyes open. So now he has 300 men. Now this is cool. Gideon tells his 300 men, he says, now go home, I wanna, here's what I want, get your horn, get your torch, and get your dishes. Your horn, your torch, and your dishes. They all had swords. They were ready to fight. He said, get your horn, your torch, and your dishes. Get your clay pots. He said, now he broke them up in groups of 100, put them around the enemy at night, and he says, when I give the signal, raise your torch, blow your horn, and break your dishes. And that's what they did. And the army rose up and said, the enemy's upon us. And they stumbled around and they killed each other. And that was Gideon. Do this with me, Gideon. Gideon. So we have Judges, Deborah, Gideon. All right, now, the last one was a judge that he should have had everything. I mean, his birth was foretold. His birth was promised. His ministry was promised. His, his mission was promised. God had given his parents everything. They said, you raise him as a Nazarite. No strong drink shall touch his lips. He shall not touch anything unclean. He shall not cut his hair. You know who I'm talking about, don't you? But Samson didn't live by any of those promises. He lived by his own way. And he did kill many Philistines, but eventually, through toying with a woman he was living with named Delilah, he gave away a secret that his hair was a symbol of his strength. And Philistines cut his hair and put out both of his eyes, and he pushed a millstone. At the end of his life, it shouldn't have been the end of his life, but it was. They threw a big party in the, the temple of their god in the Philistines. They were all just, I mean, they were rejoicing over the victory over Samson. Um, his, he couldn't see. They said, bring Samson out. He asked to be put between the two main pillars. And he did something he had never done before. He said, God, give me strength. And he pushed down that temple and it killed the Philistines and God saved his people through Samson. So this is Deborah, this is Gideon. What, Samson? So do it with me, <laughs> Samson. All right, so we have Judges, Judges, Deborah, Gideon, Samson. There you go. All right, so you're doing great. All right, so let's do that again. Twelve tribes, twelve tribes, Judges, Deborah, Gideon, Samson. Now, at the end of Judges, it's like, okay, that's cool. You said all those things. We know who's in the book. We didn't cover all the Judges. But there's one thing I want you to take away from Judges. The last verse. The last verse of the book of Judges says this. Everyone, we draw a circle around everyone in the room, and we say, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Do that with me. Ready? Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And that is the lesson of the judges. When God makes a covenant with His people and He gives them the promised life and they live their own way, how heartbreaking is that? People, why would people say, serve the God of the Jews? Why would they want to serve the God of the Jews when God's people live that way and they don't experience the promises? That happens a lot in the Christian life. Hypocrites, why would I want to live that way? Are we pursuing the promises to live them out? The judges in the time, they didn't. God had to continually save them and save them and save them. And so do that with me again. Here we go, ready? Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. See, I believe that this is the definition of sin. People say, what is sin? Well, they say it's missing the mark or it's wickedness or iniquity. Here's the thing. Paul said this, for the wages of sin is death. Do you know what's the Old Testament verse that's equivalent to that verse? Nobody knows. But it's in Proverbs. The second wisest man who ever lived said it. He said, there's a way that seems right to a man. But in the end, where does it lead? Death. Listen, in algebra, if A equals C and B equals C, A and B equal each other. The way that seems right to a man leads to death. The wages of sin, sin's wages is death. The way that seems right to a man and sin is the same thing. But don't be logical about it. Just think of the prophet. What did the prophet say? All we like sheep have gone astray. How do we do it? We turn to our own way. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's what our sin is. That's it. Now, did everybody do what was right in their own eyes? 
It's like, are there any exceptions? Yeah, there are. Actually, there was an exception. There's a little town down here in the southern part of the land. Y'all know that little town? You, you sing a song about it. Oh, little town. Yeah, there was a man named Elimelech who lived down here, and when, during the time of the judges, when famine came, he moved his family over here to Moab. Y'all remember Moab? That's where Moses preached the three sermons, right? So he took his wife over there and his sons over there, and his sons married two Moabite women. Now, Elimelech died. I love Elimelech. We don't talk very much about Elimelech, but you know what Elimelech means? My God is king. Isn't that cool? Elimelech. And so he, his wife is now a widow in a foreign land. So she's a widow and an immigrant. But she has her two sons, and as long as you have children in the Bible, you got your social security, right? At least sons. Well, then her sons die. She tells the girls, the daughter-in-laws, go home. I'm going to go back to my land. I don't want to be, I'm going to be a widow no matter what I do, so I don't want to be an immigrant too. And she wants to go back to her land where she'll be at home. And the girls, at first they both relent, but then one of them goes and one of them stays. Orpah leaves and Ruth stays. Now, I love this story because we always talk about Ruth because of what God did for Ruth. But I love Naomi. You know why? Now, raise your hand. Mother-in-laws, how many of you agree with your daughter-in-laws about your son 100% of the time? That's a dangerous thing to do. Daughter-in-laws, how many of you agree with your mother-in-law about your, their, your husband 100% of the time? I won't do it. Okay. Because here's two women who naturally have tension. Naturally. But this woman lives in such a way that her daughter-in-law would say, your people are my people and your God is my God. Wow, isn't that powerful? And so Ruth goes with Naomi back to that little town called Bethlehem. And there's this whole leveret thing where another man takes a widow and gives her children, gives her husband children through her. And there was a man named Boaz who did that. And they beget Obed, and Obed beget Jesse, and Jesse beget David, who would eventually be king, whose descendant would be our Christ. Amen? Isn't that good? And so everyone did what was right in his own eyes, except, and take both hands and put them over your heart and say, Ruth. Ruth. Because we, Ruth is a powerful story. Let's look up here and let's see. All right, see what we got. Uh, what book is this? The book of Ruth. That's right, the book is Ruth. And um, what's the key word to the book of Ruth? It's a love, what do you read in a book? Story. It's a love story. That's right. All right, so let's stand up together and let's review a little bit here. All right. Woo. So here we go. Am I... Okay, I'm moving. Here we go. So we started with, uh, let's do everyone did what was right. Let's do that fat last. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes except Ruth. All right, let's go back to 12 tribes. Ready? 12 tribes, Judges, Deborah, Gideon, Samson. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes except Ruth. All right, let's go back to Joshua. All right, here we go. Ready? Joshua, divide, conquer, 12 tribes, judges, Deborah, Gideon, Samson, everyone did what was right in his own eyes except Ruth. All right, how are you feeling? I didn't give you chances to review that time, did I? All right, let's go back to Moses. Let's just don't go that far. Ready? All right, here we go. Ready? Moses, Passover, law, tabernacle, offerings, feast, counting, spying, wandering, dying, second law, Joshua, divide, conquer, 12 tribes, judges, Deborah, Gideon, Samson, everyone did what was right in his own eyes except Ruth and some other guy. Have a seat. All right, so we finished the promised land. Now we're entering the kingdoms. The kingdoms. The kingdoms, all right. So as we enter the kingdoms, we put these two sections, the united kingdom and the divided kingdom together. Now the other exception to, um, to the uh, uh, time of the judges was a family uh, a man named Elkanah, he had two wives, Hannah and Penina, and, and Hannah had no sons, and Penina used to just 
I mean, she would just pester her and tease her. And I mean, she was mean. Hannah was at Shiloh at the temple at Passover, and she was praying for a son. And Eli, the priest, thought she was drunk, so he started to rebuke her, tell her she was wrong. And she said, I'm not drunk. I'm just praying that the Lord would give me a son. She prayed that if the Lord would give her a son, she'd give him back to the Lord. That's what she prayed. And Eli said, okay, you're going to have your prayer this time next year. She did. She had a son, and she named him the Lord Hears. Y'all know his name? Samuel. So put your finger hand by your ear and say Samuel. Because the Lord Hears. The interesting thing about this is when she gave Samuel to Eli to serve the Lord, the Lord called Samuel. One night he said, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel got up and ran to Eli. Uh, I'm here. What do you need? He said, uh, I didn't call you. He did it again. Eli finally said, listen, when you hear it, when you hear it again, say, yes, Lord, I'm listening. So Samuel hears the Lord call again. He says, yes, Lord, I'm listening. And Samuel, God tells Samuel everything he's going to do and how he's going to judge the priesthood and how he's going to work. And so the next morning he gets up. And Eli says, what did the Lord say? Can you imagine a young man? And here's the old priest. And he goes, mm, not really anything. <laughs> what do you want to tell him? Well, you're going to die, sucker. No. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't want to tell me. He says, well, then if what, if what the Lord said, if you won't tell me, then may it happen to you. <laughs> well, then he just started going, well, here's what's going to happen. Well, everything the Lord said came through. Eli and his sons, were both, they both died. And then the Lord said something to Samuel. Here's what he said. The Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Mm. And that is the culmination of the time of the judges. That's what they did. They, they did not trust the Lord. They did not believe His Word. They did not know His Word. They did not live His Word. Wow, may we never be that way. And so God starts working in a new way in the kingdom. And, and the first thing he does is he tells Samuel, he says, listen, I'm going to give the people a king. And so this is the beginning of what we call the united kingdom. So you take both hands, you put them above your head, and you say united kingdom. So we say Ruth and Samuel united kingdom now the united kingdom had three kings they all reigned 40 years that means the united kingdom lasted 120 years okay now the first king let me see if i'm supposed to share this with you uh before i get there um this is the end of it the first king was a man named saul god gave samuel said choose saul when people they'd never had a king before what does a king look like they'd never had a king but when he chose Saul, Saul stood head and shoulders above everybody else. And when people looked at him, they went, oh, a king. He's a king. And so when we choose a king, what we do is we crown him. So take your hands and say, Saul. Saul. Now, don't do this. It's not, it's not antlers. It's not deer scene. You might get shot. Do this. with the Saul. Saul. So we have Samuel, United Kingdom, Saul. Now, here's the thing. When we say, okay, what were the kings supposed to do? Here, get this. This is no surprise for God. In fact, when you read through Deuteronomy, you know what God tells the kings to do? You say, he told the kings to do? Yeah, he said, when you have a king, he's to sit on his throne. The priest is to bring him the law. The king is supposed to sit there and write the law in his own hand in the presence of the priest. And then he's supposed to keep his copy of the law with him all the days. That's how important the law was to the king. But Samuel would tell Saul what to do, and Saul wouldn't do it. God would tell Samuel, Samuel would tell Saul, Saul wouldn't do it. And, 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 and that was the deal. Saul did not have a heart for God. Where your heart is, there your treasure will be. Is your treasure in God's word? Saul's wasn't. Look at what Samuel said. Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord. Isn't that interesting? You've rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. Wow. So what we do is we, take our, we, we grab our heart and we say, no heart. Because Saul had no heart for God. So say, Saul, no heart. Saul, no heart. So Saul had no heart for God. Well, the next thing that happened was that 
God, God's going to give them a new king. Now, there was a young man who came along and he tended sheep and he was, he, he, he was from Bethlehem and he had taken food to his brothers, all this stuff. Samuel goes to his house, but look at the instruction God gives Samuel. Look at the instruction. The Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his outward appearance. Remember? Saul, oh, a king. God says, don't look at his outward appearance, the height of his stature, because I've rejected him. God does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but what does God look at? He looks at the heart. And so God tells Samuel, you look at the heart. You look at the heart. Now, um, all of this happens in this book. What book is this? You don't got that one, do you? Say it. Yeah, it's sand, one sand mule. Yeah, that's what it is. One sand mule. So, so first Samuel. And what's the key word to the book of first Samuel? Saul. Yeah, see, he's holding a saw, and he's, uh, he's got a patch on his sleeve, and what does it have on it? No heart. He has no heart. That's right. So for, if you want to read about Saul in the beginning of David, you read in 1 Samuel, because that's where you find Samuel and Saul in the beginning of David. All right, and so now God, Samuel goes to Jesse's house. He, he looks at all the brothers. None of them are there. They leave the runt outside they leave david outside he's catch you know he's tending sheep he comes in and who does god choose to lead his people but a shepherd yeah moses was a shepherd god chooses a shepherd named david david becomes king and so crown him and say david now david is interesting because what kind of heart did god have for for did david have for god i mean we have we have verses like this your word i've treasured in my heart that i might not sin against you uh your lamp is a uh, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We have, we have these great verses, but we also have a man who doesn't go to war with his armies. He stays home. He sees a woman on her, on her rooftop. If, you, if you've ever been, they've uncovered the city of David, and David's house was the highest point in the city. You look out David's house, you're going to see rooftops. And he focuses in on one woman. He takes her. She becomes pregnant. To cover it up, he calls her husband back to try and deceive everybody, except her. She knew. When he, would not, when he was too loyal to his army, he wouldn't spend time with his wife. He sent him back with the, with the execution order to be killed. And Joab pulls the army back, and the opposing army kills Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. And so here he is now. He's an adulterer. He's a derelict king, and now he's a murderer. What kind of heart did he have for God? Well, when Samuel's, when Samuel's uh, successor comes in, and tells him the story about a man who took, a rich man who took a poor man's lamb. He said, you're the man. You're the man who exploits the weak. You're the man who has sinned. And David says, oh, woe is me. Psalm 51 is the one we attribute to it. He's broken. I, I, as a pastor, I've always had wonderful senior adult ladies, and they say, pastor, I'm just an old sinner. <laughs> I always say, wait, you need to change that. You need to get over that. Because we're not supposed to be old sinners. We're supposed to be repenters. When we know what's wrong, we repent of it because we know who can fix us. David repented. It wasn't because he was perfect that he had a heart for God. It was because he repented of sin, that he sought the Lord. God knows we're not perfect. That's why John wrote, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to give, forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God knows we're sinners. He just wants us to seek him and walk with him and know him and to become like him. And so David turns his heart towards the Lord. And so we say David had a whole heart. He had a whole heart for God. Not because he was perfect, but because he was repentant. Because he was broken over his sin. And so what book is this? Yeah, you got that one easier, didn't you? Second Samuel. There's two of them. And uh, what, who's the main character in Second Samuel? Who's the key word? David. David. He had a whole heart. That's right. David's the main character. Now look at this book. You have to think a little bit more. Chronicles, but it, there's a couple of them. How many do you see there? One, First Chronicles. And who's the king in the chronicle? He's got the harp. It's David. Chronicles is the priestly view of the reign of a king. So we call it an editorial on David. That's what we call chronicles. An editorial on David. All right. At the end of David's life, 
His first son with Bathsheba died. His second son, God promised he would be king. At the end of his life, he calls Samuel in, and he says something to him. This is amazing. At the end of his life, he calls Samuel in, and he says, Now, therefore, he was telling David, he said, Now, all of my mighty men, some of them didn't do what was right. One of them was Joab, his general, his, his uh, secretary of, of defense. He didn't do what was right. And he didn't, he didn't follow David's instruction. He wasn't a righteous man. And David calls Solomon in, and he says this. He says, Now, therefore, do not let him go unpunished, for you are a wise man. Now, we know Solomon had wisdom, don't we? But this was before he asked for it. David said, you're a wise man, Solomon. See, Solomon became king, so put your crown up and say Solomon. And Solomon would become king, but his father said, you're a wise man. And when Solomon became king, God said, whatever you want, I'll give to you. So you ask for it. He asked for wisdom, and God said, I'm going to bless you with everything else because you asked for wisdom. Where did Solomon get the idea to ask for wisdom? Maybe from his father. Have you ever thought that what you speak into your children's lives, they might believe it? And it may be the very thing they say, God, that's what I need. And so if we're always telling them how difficult they are, they might think I'm just a difficult person. Mm. Or if we're telling them, no, you're really smart, you're wise. You, they might say, God, I need wisdom. So Solomon becomes this wise man. God gives him that wisdom. He marries all these foreign princesses and has peace and the land. He built the temple. He built all of those things. But one of the things that happened is he allowed those foreign princesses to bring their gods with them. And then he built their gods' altars. And then he built their gods' temples. And then he bowed down to those gods. So he started well, but he ended poorly. He didn't have no heart for God, but he didn't have a whole heart for God. What kind of heart did he have? He had a half heart. That's right. He had a half heart. And so, um, what book is this? See, we have 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, then we have 1 Chronicles, but then we don't have any more Samuels. It's not 2. There's, there's no chronicle there. 1 Kings. 1 Kings. And so if you want to read about Samuel, you read 1 Kings. All right? And so that's it. He had a half heart. And so 1 Kings, the key word is Solomon. Did I say Samuel? I meant to say Solomon. So Solomon, here's the structure. You have 1 Samuel, then you have 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles and Psalms in the, pro in the poetry. And then 1 Kings, you have Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. The interesting thing is to ask the question, which book was written at the beginning of Solomon's reign? Was it Song of Songs, Song of Solomon, or was it Ecclesiastes? Song of Solomon. Yeah, he's, he's singing about new love. Which one was written at the end of his reign? Ecclesiastes. Everything's vanity. It's a man with a half heart. Isn't that something? And, and so that, that kind of flows out. You see the perspective of the poetry uh, there. And so at the end of Solomon's reign... He had a general, and this general went to God and said, he, the king is not right. The king is unrighteous. And God told this man to tear, to tear this cloth into 12 pieces. And then he said to him, he said, Take for yourself 10 pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and give you 10 tribes. Solomon's half-heart had consequences. Solomon's half-heart did not lead to a united kingdom, it led to a divided kingdom. It led to a divided kingdom. If you and I live with a half heart, we will never know the devastation of its consequences. Hmm. Because it ripped Israel in half. What will it rip in half in your life? Who will it rip in half? Who will know the devastation of a half heart. And so when we get to this place in the kingdoms, that's, that becomes the focus. Now here's one thing I want to show you. Okay, let's do this together. Let's say Samuel, Samuel, United Kingdom, Saul, no heart, David, whole heart, Solomon, half heart. Here's a good thing. You just have the prayer request for any person you know. You're thinking, what do you mean? Every person you meet is either going to have no heart for God will have a whole heart for God or will have a half heart for God. I say every person you know, people are like, why do you like to peg people that way? I don't want to peg them, I want to pray for them. 
because I want to see them have a whole heart. A person with no heart can have a heart eventually. Every person is there. All three of these kings represent every person we know. Might represent you. You might be a Solomon today. You need a whole heart for God. Isn't the, the Scripture good? It just it, it applies to right where we are. All right, let's do it again. Sam, Samuel, Samuel, united kingdom, Saul, no heart, David, whole heart, Solomon, half heart. All right, stand up with me. All right, let's do this again. Ready, Samuel, Samuel, united kingdom, Saul, no heart, David, whole heart, Solomon, half heart. All right, do that two times with your neighbors. I got 30 minutes. All right, here we go. You ready? Samuel, United Kingdom, Saul, no heart, David, whole heart, Solomon, half heart. Have a seat. Solomon's half heart leads to a divided kingdom. The United Kingdom lasted 120 years. The divided kingdom lasts 400 years. Now here's a quick little way. There's the northern part of the kingdom. That's the Israel. The southern part of the kingdom is Judah. Judah is where Jerusalem is. Judah is in Jeru Jerusalem's in Judah. So Jeroboam takes the northern part of the kingdom, and Rehoboam, Solomon's son, takes the southern part of the kingdom. And so, just a summary: the northern part of the kingdom had 19 kings. The southern part of the kingdom had 19 or 20 monarchs, one queen. 20, 19 kings and one queen. She tried to take the kingdom from one of her sons. you got to read that. It's interesting. So you have north, south, Israel, Judah, 19, 20. You use you, alphabetical and, and numerical order, and you, you stay kind of, that's, that's what these kingdoms look like. Now you're thinking, okay, so we're talking about 39. We just did three, so let's get started. we got a lot more to go. No, I'm just kidding. Here's the story. Jerusalem's in the south. Jeroboam says, if my people go to Passover in Jerusalem, they might return to Rehoboam. So Jeroboam builds two calves. And he says, go worship God at these two calves. Now, had Israel tried this before? Yeah, I didn't talk about it, but they did. At Sinai. Did it work that time? <laughs> Took another pair of tablets for the law because Moses got so angry with them. It didn't work this time either. Every king in the north allowed those calves to remain. All 19 kings. Every king's epitaph in the scripture says he did not depart from the wickedness of Jeroboam. Some of them did tear down the Baal altars and some of them did tear down the Asherah poles. They did tear down the foreign gods, but they looked at those two calves and they said worship God there. They never tore them down. There were no good kings in Israel in the northern kingdom. And Israel never recovered from that. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. In the southern kingdom, they had 20 monarchs, but most of them weren't good. There were eight that were good. Jehoshaphat, uh, Joash, Josiah, Hezekiah. You know, there, there were eight that were good. And they were good not because they were perfect. They weren't even as good as, Je as David. But they sought the Lord at some time during their reign. That's why we call them good kings. There were eight in the south. So we say, well, okay, so this kingdom lasted 400 years, and you have zero good kings in the north and eight good kings in the south, so we're going to do the eight, right? Nope. We're just going to take our thumbs, we're going to put them down, and we're going to say, mostly bad kings. That's what we're going to do. So we have divided kingdom, mostly bad kings. Now, that was quick, wasn't it? We could wrap up fast if it's all like that from now on, but that's not it. You say, well, okay, mostly bad kings. So, what, so what's important? Well, when the kings wouldn't listen to God, God raised up men who would speak for him. In fact, that's what their name means, spokesman. The Hebrew word for prophet is spokesman. That's it. They spoke for God. 
And they spoke and they said, we used to say it this way, they told the people of Israel, shape up or ship out. Because they either shape up and seek the Lord or God's going to move them out of their land. And so what we do is we just say now, we just take our hand in front of our face and go, prophets, speak. Prophets, speak speak the prophet spoke and they said shape up or ship out god's gonna god's gonna remove you from the promise if you don't seek the lord and that was what they told him so so we have divided kingdom mostly bad kings prophets speak well that was easy 400 years that was quicker than we've ever covered anything before all right do it with me again ready divided kingdom mostly bad kings Prophets speak. Now you're you're standing here now and you're saying you're sitting here and you're saying, okay, now talk to us about the prophets. I can't. They don't get you anywhere. They don't move you through the story. They just talk about the condition of God's people and the promise if God's people return to God, what he's going to do for them. Now, after we finish the whole story, I can take just a couple of minutes and I can share with you where the prophets fit. Okay? So we'll get back to the prophets in a moment. All right, so stand up with me and let's review that much. All right, so here we go. Divided kingdom, divided kingdom, mostly bad kings, prophets speak. All right, all right, one more time. Divided kingdom, mostly bad kings, prophets speak. Now do it without talking. Now you talked. (laughs) Don't talk. Here we go. No, no talking. (laughs) I love it, because you're thinking, and so it just comes out. All right, ready? (laughs) All right, let's start with Samuel. No talking. How you do? All right. Have a seat. Have a seat. All right, so, now remember the north, what, con- what part of the country, what's the name of the north? Israel. So what God did is he raised up a people over here in the northeast, and they're called Assyria. They're kind of Padanaram and up here in the north, and they're called Assyria. Now God had sent, he had sent a prophet to Assyria to prepare them. Y'all remember his name? He's the fish prophet. Yeah, you got it. Jonah. And Jonah told them to repent, and what did they do? They did. So they became a world power, and they had a foreign policy. Now, here was their foreign policy. If they conquered you, you didn't stay. What they did, they did what my mom did. When she'd walk in a room, and me and my cousins and my brothers, we were all wrestling, she'd go, okay, you sit here, and you sit here, and she'd separate us. That's what their foreign policy was. They would take a nation, and they would scatter the people all over their realm. Because if you're scattered, what can you not do? You can't cause trouble. You can't rebel. So what we do is we're going to say Israel. So reach right over here in Israel and say Israel, scatter. All right? And that's what happens. So Israel scattered. All right. So prophets speak. Israel scatter. So what the prophets were saying was coming true. Now Assyria was defeated by another foreign power that that was right over here to the east, all the way down to Ur, all the way up here to the north. And they were called Babylonia. Now, Babylonia had a different foreign policy. Babylonia was my mother's foreign policy in church. Yeah, I would sit with my friends, and when I was cutting up, I could feel these two eyeballs burning holes in the back of my head. And I would turn around, and I'd look reluctantly, and she would say, and she'd sit me right beside her. And that's what Babylonia did. What they would do is they would take the who's who, the aristocratic, aristocratic class, those who were knowledgeable, those who were educated, those who had position, and they would pick them up and they would carry them to Babylon so that they could keep an eye on them. And so what we do, we call that exile. So what we do is we grab Judah down south and we say, Judah, exile. So we have Israel, scatter, Judah, exile. Now, this is interesting because I don't know what I did with my, my clicker. All right. Um, this is interesting because at the end of Judah, the last king's name was Zedekiah. And Zedekiah was actually put in on his throne by Nebuchadnezzar, the ruler of Babylonia. Okay. But, Nebuchadnezzar, but Zedekiah did not seek the Lord. 
And look at what the scripture says in Chronicles. It says that Zedekiah, he also rebelled against the king Nebuchadnezzar. Now that would be a good thing, right? You're rebelling against the foreign king, but no. Because he made, Nebuchadnezzar made him swear allegiance by God, but he stiffened its neck and hardened his heart against turning to the Lord God of Israel. And so Israel and J Judah had turned their hearts away from God, even to this point. And so God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to remove them from Israel, from their land. And that's what happened. And this is at the end. Now, the books that we're looking at now is what book is this? What, what book in the, in the Old Testament? Second Kings. There's two kings and they're on an island. The trees make an X. What's the key word? Exile. Second Kings is all about the prophets telling them God's going to remove you if you don't trust Him, if you don't seek Him. And that's what happened. And so that, there you go. Now, Chronicles, what, which Chronicle is this? Second Chronicles. Now, it says it's an editorial on who? Judah. That's interesting. See, when, when Jeroboam set those two calves up in Israel, the priest said, we're not going to have anything to do with this graven images. Right? So where'd the priest go? Jerusalem. Judah. If they didn't go, they didn't practice their religion. And so the only people who could write an editorial on a king were the priests, and they wrote it in Judah. That's why we only have an editorial on the kings of Judah in Second Chronicles. Isn't that interesting? And so that's, that's where it brings us to. Now, we enter the last section. Aren't you happy to hear that? The last section. We're only like, what, four books away from finishing the Old Testament history here? So we've covered a, a bunch of them. We are entering the time of captivity and the coming kingdom. And as we enter that time, where are God's people? They're in Babylonian, right? They're in Babylonia. Now, here's the thing. They're in Babylonia, but now Babylon, Babylon is defeated by another power who is out here in the parking lot, actually. And they're Persia, the modern-day Iran. Yeah, so this is modern-day Syria, um, this modern-day Iraq, this is modern-day Iran. And the Persians had a different foreign policy. They would let you go home. And they said, if you take care of your homeland, we'll just extra extract tribute, and you'll, you'll be more productive. And they let them go home. And so they let them return. So what we do is grab Judah, and we say, Judah, return. So we have Israel, scatter, Judah, exile, Judah, return. Now, they were in exile 70 years. That's how long they were in exile. One, you could say one generation. If you count generations as 40 years, the two generations. But they were in exile 70 years. Now, how did the returns work? Here's how the returns worked. The first return was a, a ruler. His name was Zerubbabel. And here's, here's what I've been told. We share this with the kids. Uh, someone came to Zerubbabel and said, Hey, Zerubbabel, come on the double We're in trouble The temple's in rubble and so Zerubbabel came back to rebuild the temple. Say Zerubbabel and make a little triangle and say temple. So Zerubbabel was the first return. He came back to rebuild the temple. So Zerubbabel, temple. The next thing that happened is there was a, a, a king who took the throne in Persia, but he got mad at his wife. Her name was Vashti. He called her to come. She didn't come. He said, I know how to deal with you. You're out of here. He got rid of her. And then he looked for a new queen. They looked for a beautiful queen. They picked a Jewish woman. They did not know that. Her name was Hadassah. And her, name was, her Persian name was Esther. The prime minister, if we want to say it that way, his name was Haman. He hated Esther's uncle. He hated the Jews. He got the king to sign an edict saying that they, all of the Jews would be killed on a certain year. And uh, Mordecai knew this. Mordecai was the type of man that he, he cared about where he lived. He cared about where he lived. I, I love it. I was in China three weeks ago or, or a month ago uh, teaching with New Orleans Seminary. And, um, and I asked the pastor, I said, how do you pastor here? How do you do that? He says, this is my country. 
They were celebrating 70 years as the People's Republic of China when I was there. That was amazing to be there during that. And he got his daughter a flag. He, it's his country. I said, aren't you afraid? He said, no, as long as I'm a small church and I'm, just, I'm not making a big splash, they're not going to come get me. He'd been arrested twice. But he loved the Lord. And he loved the place he lived. Mordecai, he was in Persia. He cared about the king. There was a coup. There was a, a plot to overthrow the king, and Mordecai reported it. And Mordecai's name went into the annals of Persia. Mordecai was telling her, Esther, Esther, you need to talk to the king about this, this destruction that's coming upon us by Haman. Esther was trying to put together a, a banquet. She did finally, and she did tell the king. And when she was doing all that, what God was doing is one night the king couldn't sleep, and so he pulled out the record of his reign, and he read about a name, man named Mordecai who reported a coup. And at that banquet, he asked Haman, Haman, what should I do to the man I want to, for the man I want to honor? And Haman thought, he wants to honor me. Haman was building a gallows for Mordecai at his house. And he, he's, Haman's thinking, he wants to honor me. You should put your robe, put him on your chariot, put him, drive him through, and that, the people celebrate him. And, and he said, and Esther reports what, Mordecai, what Haman wants to do to the, her people. <laughs> Haman winds up in the gallows. Mordecai winds up the prime minister. And the edict is removed. The interesting thing about the book of Esther, though, the book of Esther, never, never is God's name found in the book of Esther. And never does God speak in the book of Esther. What a contrast to the time of the judges. Here's a man and his niece who becomes his daughter. And here they are trusting the Lord in the midst of such hopelessness. And what does the Lord do? He blesses them. And so we say, Esther, queen. Do that with me. Esther, queen. So we have Zerubbabel, temple, Esther, queen. All right, what book is this? This is the book of Esther. You see her stirring with the S. And what's the key word to the book of Esther? She is the queen of Persia. She's the queen of Persia. That's right. All right, so the next return is a man named Ezra, and Ezra is a scribe. It's the first time we really see that word. He's a scribe. He's concerned about the teaching of God's Word. Remember, synagogues were created during the exile so that they could keep teaching God's Word. And he comes back to Judah, and he finds the people not living faithfully to the Word of God. So he seeks to restore the people. And so we say, Ezra, people. People. Ezra, people. So we have Zerubbabel, temple, Esther, queen, Ezra, people. And so, what book is all that found in? Ezra. Yeah, when you read the book of Ezra, you find two personalities there. You find Zerubbabel and you find Ezra. Now, what, are, what is the key word to the book of Ezra? What do you see in the background? People and Temple. You find people in temple. And that was it. Zerubbabel's focus was the temple. Ezra's focus was the people. All right, now there's one more return. And the last return is a man named Nehemiah. Nehemiah is the cupbearer of the king. His heart breaks because the city of David, the city that God gave David, is, is, is destroyed. The gates are down, or the walls are down, and the gates are burned. And Nehemiah, finally, the king sees it in Nehemiah's life, says, What's wrong? Nehemiah tells him what's wrong. The king gives him permission, gives him provision, and he travels back to rebuild the, the walls of the city. Y'all remember how long it took to rebuild the walls of the city? You remember, the walls of the city were being rebuilt, and they did, nobody, everybody was happy, right? No, there were people there who didn't want it. Sanballat, Tobias, they didn't want the walls rebuilt. And so actually what Nehemiah did is he said, now where is your house in the city wall? And they'd say, oh, my house is right here in this part. So he'd say, okay, you build the wall right here. And he'd say, you have your tools and you have your sword. And you rebuild the wall where your house is. Because where are you going to build the wall good? Your house or somebody else's? Your house. You know, if you're a real servant, you're going to care about somebody else. But hey, he knew that. So that's how they rebuilt the city. How many days did it take? I gave you days. How many days are there in a year? 365. How many days do you think it took to rebuild the walls of the city? Like 52. Over a month. Isn't that amazing? 
And so what we do is we take our hands down. See, we've said, Ezra, people, take your hands down to your knees and raise your hands up and say, Nehemiah, walls. All right, so we have Zerubbabel, temple, Esther, queen, Ezra, people, Nehemiah, walls. All right, stand up with me. All right, now we've covered a whole section. Let's review Israel. Israel, scatter, Judah, exile, Judah, return. All right, now let's do Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, temple, Esther, queen, Ezra, people, Nehemiah, walls. All right, now, I'm going to do it one more time, and I want you to review with your neighbor, but I only go, we're going to review Zerubbabel to Nehemiah. All right, so let's do that again. Ready? Zerubbabel, temple, Esther, queen, Ezra, people, Nehemiah, walls. And turn to your neighbor and do that three times. All right, here we go. Zerubbabel, temple, Esther, queen, Ezra, people, Nehemiah, walls. All right, let's go back to Israel. Ready? Here we go. Israel, scatter, Judah, exile, Judah, return, Zerubbabel, temple, Esther, queen, Ezra, people, Nehemiah, walls. All right, have a seat. Give yourselves a hand there. All right, now. What book did we just cover right there? What book is that? Nehemiah. And what's the key word to Nehemiah? Walls. Y'all did it. Y'all did a great job. All right. How many, did everybody receive one of these big cards right here? I need you to... If everybody got one of these, if you didn't get one, hold up your hand. All right. I got a few, guys. Could you help me? Keep your hand up. This is the only thing I'm accountable to walk through the Bible for. They want to know what you thought about today. So please take this card and fill out your information. There you can request. The only thing that we have the hand signs in is a, a email devotional form. We don't do video. It doesn't really translate well into video. And so they will send you a devotional for 40 days. If you request it right under the personal information, you can sign up for email reminders on the hand sign. We'll send you a free copy of Pathways. Um, we, we take walk through the Bible tours uh, to the Bible lands. We walk through the Bible land together. And, um, and, so, and if you know churches that would benefit from an event, and then you can tell them how I did. Say I did good. I appreciate it. <laughs> but listen, um, also if God worked in your life, um, you can check one of those things that may have happened to you today or right on the back. So take a few minutes and fill that out for me, and we'll take those up at the very end. And I just have a couple of things I want to share with you. At the very end, after Nehemiah rebuilt the walls, the people were in the land. But the people, God sent prophets. He actually sent three prophets. He sent Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. He sent those three prophets. Haggai said, get busy rebuilding the temple of God. Zechariah said, the Messiah will be in this house one day. And Malachi said, listen, you people, listen. You don't listen to the Lord. You've got hearts of stone. And that message right there reverberated for 400 years. Because for 400 years, God did not send another prophet. He did not send another prophet. Now, was God working? Yes. Yes. He was preparing for the coming of His Son. And uh, we talk about that when we teach New Testament a little bit. Because there's stuff in the New Testament that God did during that 400 years. But here's the thing. They didn't listen. God stopped speaking. We do that. If I'm speaking to a group of children, I just stop talking. All of a sudden, they'll go, what happened? I taught my first kids event, uh, or my but fourth kids event in South Dakota. They had 100 kids in this elementary school. And uh, I was scared to death because I've taught kids for 30 minutes or something like that, but I've taught 100 kids for five hours. 
And I walked to the middle of the room and I got down on one knee and I just started to speak real softly. And you know what those children did? They leaned in. They wanted to know what I was saying. God stopped speaking for 400 years through prophets because he'd already spoken. He'd already spoken so much and the people weren't listening. But, so he started waiting for his people to be ready to listen. And that's what we call it, waiting. So we just kind of lean forward and we say, wait. That's what we do. We just lean forward, we say, wait. Because for 400 years they waited. A lot of stuff went on. People called out to God. A lot of stuff went on. But the people didn't listen. God, they had His law. They had His Word. But God just waited on them. Because in 400 years, God was going to break the silence. And He was going to break the silence with an angel announcing the preparation of the coming of the Messiah. Telling a young a priest, an old priest, that his wife, his old woman wife, was going to have a son. And he was going to announce the coming of of the one, the Messiah. He broke the silence by saying the Christ is coming. And so what we do is we say wait. And we say Christ. Make a cross with your arms and we say Christ. So we say wait. Christ. How long do you wait? You just got to hang with me. But that's what God did. He worked all of that out preparing for the coming of His Son. We get to read the Old Testament with expectancy of what he was going to do. Now, while you finish filling that out, in your book, I have a page that looks like this. Now, your blanks are filled in, but let me just take a minute and teach you the prophets. Man, i got four minutes till 12. I am doing awesome. All right. So, remember, this is the promised land. There are how many prophetic books in the Old Testament? Ah, you remembered. One number, 17. There were three prophets after the exile. The three prophets after the exile were Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. We always start at the end because it's easier to go from the end to the beginning rather than beginning and end. So these three prophets were in Judah after the exile, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Who are they? When did they prophesy? Y'all are slow on the uptake here. After the exile, where did they prophesy? Judah. All right. During the exile, we only have two prophetic books, and they were over here in this country over here. Do y'all remember what country I'm standing in? Babylonia. Babylonia. These two prophets dream dreams. Daniel and Ezekiel. They're the only two prophets during the exile. They're the only two during the exile. Ezekiel and Daniel, they dream dreams. I always think of the song, Beautiful Dreamer. Yeah. So Ezekiel and Daniel are during the exile, and where am I? Babylon, during the exile. That's right. All right. There were more folks than just those, but those are the two books. Now, to Assyria, there are two prophets. To Assyria, there are two prophets. The first one, I told you what his name was. What was his name? Jonah. And the second one is... Nahum. We call them the Nanas. Jonah and Nahum. Na, 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 na. Anyway, all right. They repented when Jonah preached. They did not repent when Nahum preached. And so God fulfilled his word by destroying them. All right, so who are these two prophets up here in Assyria? And when did they prophesy? I didn't say that. Before. That's right. After, during, before. Now in Israel, there are two prophets, Hosea and Amos. Hosea and Amos. And those are the two prophetic books to Israel. And they're all, see, after, before, I mean, after, during, everybody else is before. Does that make sense? Everybody else is before the exile. And then there was one prophet to Moab, well, no, to Edom. And he, he was a prophet to Edom. His name was Obadiah. See, Edom was the descendants of Esau. And Israel called for Edom to come help them. And they didn't. And God sent a prophet to say, Oh, bad, oh, bad, oh, bad. So they were oh, bad. And then there were seven prophets before the exile to Judah. How do you remember the seven prophets before the exile to Judah? I remember them with Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Are you ready? See the names? H-I-J-J-M-Z-L. That's how I remember. 
H-I-J-J-M-Z-L, 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 now I know my prophets well. And you're like, yeah, but Z, Z, Z could mean Zechariah. No, it never could. Not if I've worked my way backwards. Zechariah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Ezekiel, Daniel, Jonah, Nahum, Hosea and Amos, Obadiah, H-I-J-J-M-Z-L, Habakkuk, H-I, Isaiah, J-J, Joel and Jeremiah, M, Micah, Z, Zephaniah, L, Lamentations. You see it? You got it? So that's how we teach to remember. And that's where they fit into the history of the Old Testament. All right, so you got your prophets. You filled out your evaluation cards. All right, now i got one more card. It's called the Old Testament Live Event Card. This is a very important card because of the teach test principle. Because you have heard God today, not because you've heard me, but because His Spirit is wherever two or more are gathered in His name. Amen? And His Spirit does not, is not lazy. And so when His Word is spoken, He speaks to our hearts. This card is a question. What has God spoken to your heart today? Because if he's spoken to your heart about something in your life, you don't need to neglect it. The top of the card has a place for your name so that you can tear it in half and you can give it to someone and you can say, listen, I made a commitment to the Lord. Would you pray for me? Ask me about that commitment. Your commitment might be, I'm going to read God's Word. If that's your commitment, write that commitment on this part of the card, put it in your Bible, keep it so that when you do your devotions and you pray, you remember it as a commitment to the Lord. And then you give that to someone and you say, pray for me. Ask me how I'm doing in my commitment. You don't even have to discuss the commitment. You could just say, ask me how I'm doing in my commitment every couple of weeks or so. So that you know somebody's praying for you and you know they're going to ask you about it. People do what's inspected, not what's expected. Pastor, do you expect everybody to come to church every week? Yeah, but they don't do it, do they? But we write your name down when you come because we're glad to see you. And we, not, we don't want you here just because we need somebody to warm the pew. But the fellowship of the brothers and the sisters in Christ and the listening to His Word and the praising of our God, what does it do in the life of a believer? It's like gas in the tank. It's like gas in the tank. That's what this is all about. It's not for me. It's not for pastor. It's for you to walk faithfully with God. That's just a little tool. You say, well, I do something like this already. Great. You know what? I, I, pastors tell me all the time, say, Pastor, uh, pastor my, my church knows the Bible. We're not going to have a walk to the Bible event. And I say, they wouldn't want to do that. And I was like, sure, you're really sure? He says, because the people that don't know the Bible are going to love it because they're going to learn the Bible. The people that know the Bible are going to love it because they're going to celebrate the Bible. Amen? We're going to celebrate right now. Are you ready? We're going to walk through the whole Old Testament together in less than a minute and a half. Let's stand up together, all right? Now, we're going to do this. I tell you what, let's do some short reviews. Okay, because the new stuff gets a little, you know, it's like, okay. So let's start with Samuel. All right, let's start with Samuel. Go to the end. All right, so here we go. Ready? Samuel, United Kingdom, Saul, No Heart, David, Whole Heart, Solomon, Half Heart, Divided Kingdom, Mostly Bad Kings, Prophets Speak, Israel, Scatter, Judah, Exile, Judah, Return, Zerubbabel, Temple, Esther, Queen, Ezra, People, Nehemiah, Walls, Wait, Christ. All right. How'd you do? You're pretty good? Okay, let's go back to Moses. Now, y'all want to slow it down a little bit? All right, here we go. We're going to slow it down just a little bit. Moses. That's a little too slow, huh? All right. All right, here we go. Ready? Moses, Passover, law, tabernacle, offerings, feast, counting, spying, wandering, dying, second law, Joshua, divide, conquer, 12 tribes, judges, Deborah, Gideon, Samson, everyone did what was right in his own eyes except Ruth and Samuel. United Kingdom, Saul, no heart, David, 
whole heart, Solomon, half heart, divided kingdom, mostly bad kings, prophets speak. What'd they say? Israel, scatter, Judah, exile, Judah, return, Zerubbabel, temple, Esther, queen, Ezra, people, Nehemiah, walls, wait, Christ. Y'all got to wait. All right. Now, somebody get a second hand or get your timer on your phone. Everybody take a deep breath. That's a good one. Right up here in the front row. All right. This is it. You think you can do it in a minute and a half? Now, listen, if I mess up, we start over. If you mess up, we just keep going. Okay? <laughs> Don't mess up. I, I tell people, I usually say it at the beginning, but I hit the ground running today. I mess up a lot. And the reason I do is because I start watching you. <laughs> Not because you're messing up, but because I'm like, ooh, they're doing good. And then I'm like, oh, wait a minute, where am I? So, y'all are doing great. All right, so you ready? Take another deep breath. We got a timer ready? All right, here we go. Who's timing it for me? Oh, my. Do what? They took it down? All right, here we go. You got to start when I start. Okay, here we go. Ready? Creation, fall, flood, nations, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Passover, law, tabernacle, offerings, feast, counting, spying, wondering, dying, second law, Joshua, <laughs> divide, conquer, 12 tribes, judges, Deborah, Gideon, Samson, everyone did what was right in his own eyes except Ruth and Samuel. United Kingdom, Saul, no heart, David, whole heart, Solomon, half heart, divided kingdom, mostly bad kings, prophets speak, Israel, scatter, Judah, exile, Judah, return, Zerubbabel, temple, Esther, queen, Ezra, people, Nehemiah, walls, wait, Christ. Hey, I'm in in 14. All right, have a seat, have a seat. If you can pass those, uh, pass those uh, evaluation cards in this way, those big cards, I'd appreciate it. Y'all can pass them to the middle. We'll get those taken up. Let me say something. I've always driven by this area. Now I know there's a wonderful reason to stop. And uh, you guys have been such a blessing to enjoy and teach. I know I've taught a lot of stuff you've heard about before, but we've put it all together. And let me, let me challenge you on one thing. In the back of the book, there's one page where all these, all these 40 things are on one page. It's page 48. And uh, you say, well, how do you remember all that? Well, I read the Bible a few years and uh, learned it and then started talking about it. But to remember all 40 of those things, because you can do that in a minute and a half. If you take five minutes a day for 90 days and talk yourself back through the story of the Old Testament, five minutes, you can do it in five minutes. We just did it in a minute and a half. Somebody says, I don't understand the Old Testament. Well, do you know what happened in the Old Testament? No, well, first in Genesis, and you can just talk through the whole Bible real easily. But if you do it for 90 days for five minutes, you'll know this. And you may not recall the words exactly the same way, but you'll know the timeline of the Old Testament. I wish I'd have had this when I went to seminary. I'd have made a better grade. <laughs> Because, I mean, this is a, this is a roadmap. I, I taught, I actually taught homiletics to uh, church leaders in China. But on my breaks, I said, let's take five minutes. And I taught them each section of eight over five minutes. We couldn't do everyone did what was right in his own. The Chinese Bible doesn't say that. It says everybody did what they, everybody what they wanted, they did. So we had to change that sign to make sense. But they learned it at the end of it. They were, so happy, they were more happy about that than what I taught them in homiletics. And so you can learn the Old Testament in such a way you can talk about it. You can share. You, you can learn it in eight, five bites of eight. And each one, the first one's Genesis, the second one's the next four books of the law. 
and you just you can just pull it together. It's a great tool, and it's great to teach. You can teach it in your class and do things like that. You can't go out and be a walk through the Bible instructor unless you go through walk through the Bible, but you can teach it here in your church and in your ministry. Pastor, thank you for inviting me. It's been a blessing. Thank you all so much. God bless you.